the audiobook of Give and Take, A Revolutionary Approach to Success by Adam Grant. Presented to you by Full and Free Audiobooks. 1. Good Returns. The Dangers and Rewards of Giving More Than You Get. The Principle of Give and Take, that is Diplomacy, Give One and Take Ten. Mark Twain, Author and Humorist. On a sunny Saturday afternoon in Silicon Valley, two proud fathers stood on the sidelines of a soccer field. They were watching their young daughters play together, and it was only a matter of time before they struck up a conversation about work. The taller of the two men was Danny Shader, a serial entrepreneur who had spent time at Netscape, Motorola, and Amazon. Intense, dark-haired, and capable of talking about business forever, Shader was in his late thirties by the time he launched his first company, and he liked to call himself the old man of the internet. He loved building companies, and he was just getting his fourth startup off the ground. Shader had instantly taken a liking to the other father, a man named David Hornick who invests in companies for a living. At 5 feet 4 inches, with dark hair, glasses, and a goatee, Hornick is a man of eclectic interests. He collects Alice in Wonderland books, and in college he created his own major in computer music. He went on to earn a master's in criminology and a law degree, and after burning the midnight oil at a law firm, he accepted a job offer to join a venture capital firm, where he spent the next decade listening to pitches from entrepreneurs and deciding whether or not to fund them. During a break between soccer games, Shader turned to Hornick and said, I'm working on something, do you want to see a pitch? Hornick specialized in internet companies, so he seemed like an ideal investor to Shader. The interest was mutual. Most people who pitch ideas are first-time entrepreneurs, with no track record of success. In contrast, Shader was a blue-chip entrepreneur who had hit the jackpot not once, but twice. In 1999, his first startup, Accept.com, was acquired by Amazon for $175 million. In 2007, his next company, Good Technology, was acquired by Motorola for $500 million. Given Shader's history, Hornick was eager to hear what he was up to next. A few days after the soccer game, Shader drove to Hornick's office and pitched his newest idea. Nearly a quarter of Americans have trouble making online purchases because they don't have a bank account or credit card, and Shader was proposing an innovative solution to this problem. Hornick was one of the first venture capitalists to hear the pitch, and right off the bat, he loved it. Within a week, he put Shader in front of his partners and offered him a term sheet, he wanted to fund Shader's company. Although Hornick had moved fast, Shader was in a strong position. Given Shader's reputation, and the quality of his idea, Hornick knew plenty of investors would be clamoring to work with Shader. You're rarely the only investor giving an entrepreneur a term sheet, Hornick explains. You're competing with the best venture capital firms in the country, and trying to convince the entrepreneur to take your money instead of theirs. The best way for Hornick to land the investment was to set a deadline for Shader to make his decision. If Hornick made a compelling offer with a short fuse, Shader might sign it before he had the chance to pitch to other investors. This is what many venture capitalists do to stack the odds in their favor. But Hornick didn't give Shader a deadline. In fact, he practically invited Shader to shop his offer around to other investors. Hornick believed that entrepreneurs need time to evaluate their options, so as a matter of principle, he refused to present exploding offers. Take as much time as you need to make the right decision, he said. Although Hornick hoped Shader would conclude that the right decision was to sign with him, he put Shader's best interests ahead of his own, giving Shader space to explore other options. Shader did just that. He spent the next few weeks pitching his idea to other investors. In the meantime, Hornick wanted to make sure he was still a strong contender, so he sent Shader his most valuable resource, a list of 40 references who could attest to Hornick's caliber as an investor. Hornick knew that entrepreneurs look for the same attributes in investors that we all seek in financial advisors, competence and trustworthiness. 
When entrepreneurs sign with an investor, the investor joins their board of directors and provides expert advice. Hornick's list of references reflected the blood, sweat, and tears that he had devoted to entrepreneurs over the course of more than a decade in the venture business. He knew they would vouch for his skill and his character. A few weeks later, Hornick's phone rang. It was Shader, ready to announce his decision. I'm sorry, Shader said, but I'm signing with another investor. The financial terms of the offer from Hornick and the other investor were virtually identical, so Hornick's list of 40 references should have given him an advantage. And after speaking with the references, it was clear to Shader that Hornick was a great guy. But it was this very same spirit of generosity that doomed Hornick's case. Shader worried that Hornick would spend more time encouraging him than challenging him. Hornick might not be tough enough to help Shader start a successful business, and the other investor had a reputation for being a brilliant advisor who questioned and pushed entrepreneurs. Shader walked away thinking, I should probably add somebody to the board who will challenge me more. Hornick is so affable that I don't know what he'll be like in the boardroom. When he called Hornick, he explained, my heart said to go with you, but my head said to go with them. I decided to go with my head instead of my heart. Hornick was devastated, and he began to second-guess himself. Am I a dope? If I had applied pressure to take the term sheet, maybe he would have taken it. But I've spent a decade building my reputation so this wouldn't happen. How did this happen? David Hornick learned his lesson the hard way, good guys finish last. Or do they? According to conventional wisdom, highly successful people have three things in common, motivation, ability, and opportunity. If we want to succeed, we need a combination of hard work, talent, and luck. The story of Danny Shader and David Hornick highlights a fourth ingredient, one that's critical but often neglected, success depends heavily on how we approach our interactions with other people. Every time we interact with another person at work, we have a choice to make. Do we try to claim as much value as we can, or contribute value without worrying about what we receive in return? As an organizational psychologist and Wharton professor, I've dedicated more than 10 years of my professional life to studying these choices at organizations ranging from Google to the U.S. Air Force, and it turns out that they have staggering consequences for success. Over the past three decades, in a series of groundbreaking studies, social scientists have discovered that people differ dramatically in their preferences for reciprocity, their desired mix of taking and giving. To shed some light on these preferences, let me introduce you to two kinds of people who fall at opposite ends of the reciprocity spectrum at work. I call them takers and givers. Takers have a distinctive signature, they like to get more than they give. They tilt reciprocity in their own favor, putting their own interests ahead of others' needs. Takers believe that the world is a competitive, dog-eat-dog place. They feel that to succeed, they need to be better than others. To prove their competence, they self-promote and make sure they get plenty of credit for their efforts. Garden variety takers aren't cruel or cutthroat, they're just cautious and self-protective. If I don't look out for myself first, takers think, no one will. Had David Hornick been more of a taker, he would have given Danny Shader a deadline, putting his goal of landing the investment ahead of Shader's desire for a flexible timeline. But Hornick is the opposite of a taker, he's a giver. In the workplace, givers are a relatively rare breed. They tilt reciprocity in the other direction, preferring to give more than they get. Whereas takers tend to be self-focused, evaluating what other people can offer them, givers are other-focused, paying more attention to what other people need from them. These preferences aren't about money, givers and takers aren't distinguished by how much they donate to charity or the compensation that they command from their employers. Rather, givers and takers differ in their attitudes and actions toward other people. If you're a taker, you help others strategically, when the benefits to you outweigh the personal costs. If you're a giver, you might use a different cost-benefit analysis, you help whenever the benefits to others exceed the personal costs.
Alternatively, you might not think about the personal costs at all, helping others without expecting anything in return. If you're a giver at work, you simply strive to be generous in sharing your time, energy, knowledge, skills, ideas, and connections with other people who can benefit from them. It's tempting to reserve the giver label for larger-than-life heroes such as Mother Teresa or Mahatma Gandhi, but being a giver doesn't require extraordinary acts of sacrifice. It just involves a focus on acting in the interests of others, such as by giving help, providing mentoring, sharing credit, or making connections for others. Outside the workplace, this type of behavior is quite common. According to research led by Yale psychologist Margaret Clark, most people act like givers in close relationships. In marriages and friendships, we contribute whenever we can without keeping score. But in the workplace, give and take becomes more complicated. Professionally, few of us act purely like givers or takers, adopting a third style instead. We become matchers, striving to preserve an equal balance of giving and getting. Matchers operate on the principle of fairness. When they help others, they protect themselves by seeking reciprocity. If you're a matcher, you believe in tit for tat, and your relationships are governed by even exchanges of favors. Giving, taking, and matching are three fundamental styles of social interaction, but the lines between them aren't hard and fast. You might find that you shift from one reciprocity style to another as you travel across different work roles and relationships. Asterisk it wouldn't be surprising if you act like a taker when negotiating your salary, a giver when mentoring someone with less experience than you, and a matcher when sharing expertise with a colleague. But evidence shows that at work, the vast majority of people develop a primary reciprocity style, which captures how they approach most of the people most of the time. And this primary style can play as much of a role in our success as hard work, talent, and luck. In fact, the patterns of success based on reciprocity styles are remarkably clear. If I asked you to guess who's the most likely to end up at the bottom of the success ladder, what would you say, takers, givers, or matchers? Professionally, all three reciprocity styles have their own benefits and drawbacks. But there's one style that proves more costly than the other two. Based on David Hornick's story, you might predict that givers achieve the worst results, and you'd be right. Research demonstrates that givers sink to the bottom of the success ladder. Across a wide range of important occupations, givers are at a disadvantage. They make others better off but sacrifice their own success in the process. In the world of engineering, the least productive and effective engineers are givers. In one study, when more than 160 professional engineers in California rated one another on help given and received, the least successful engineers were those who gave more than they received. These givers had the worst objective scores in their firm for the number of tasks, technical reports, and drawings completed, not to mention errors made, deadlines missed, and money wasted. Going out of their way to help others prevented them from getting their own work done. The same pattern emerges in medical school. In a study of more than 600 medical students in Belgium, the students with the lowest grades had unusually high scores on giver statements like, I love to help others, and, I anticipate the needs of others. The givers went out of their way to help their peers study, sharing what they already knew at the expense of filling gaps in their own knowledge, and it gave their peers a leg up at test time. Salespeople are no different. In a study I led of salespeople in North Carolina, compared with takers and matchers, givers brought in two and a half times less annual sales revenue. They were so concerned about what was best for their customers that they weren't willing to sell aggressively. Across occupations, it appears that givers are just too caring, too trusting, and too willing to sacrifice their own interests for the benefit of others. There's even evidence that compared with takers, on average, givers earn 14% less money, have twice the risk of becoming victims of crimes, and are judged as 22% less powerful and dominant. So if givers are most likely to land at the bottom of the success ladder, who's at the top, takers or matchers? Neither. When I took another look at the data, I discovered a surprising pattern, it's the givers again. 
As we've seen, the engineers with the lowest productivity are mostly givers. But when we look at the engineers with the highest productivity, the evidence shows that they're givers too. The California engineers with the best objective scores for quantity and quality of results are those who consistently give more to their colleagues than they get. The worst performers and the best performers are givers, takers and matchers are more likely to land in the middle. This pattern holds up across the board. The Belgian medical students with the lowest grades have unusually high giver scores, but so do the students with the highest grades. Over the course of medical school, being a giver accounts for 11% higher grades. Even in sales, I found that the least productive salespeople had 25% higher giver scores than average performers, but so did the most productive salespeople. The top performers were givers, and they averaged 50% more annual revenue than the takers and matchers. Givers dominate the bottom and the top of the success ladder. Across occupations, if you examine the link between reciprocity styles and success, the givers are more likely to become champs, not only chumps. Guess which one David Hornick turns out to be? After Danny Shader signed with the other investor, he had a gnawing feeling. We just closed a big round. We should be celebrating. Why am I not happier? I was excited about my investor, who's exceptionally bright and talented, but I was missing the opportunity to work with Hornick. Shader wanted to find a way to engage Hornick, but there was a catch. To involve him, Shader and his lead investor would have to sell more of the company, diluting their ownership. Shader decided it was worth the cost to him personally. Before the financing closed, he invited Hornick to invest in his company. Hornick accepted the offer and made an investment, earning some ownership of the company. He began coming to board meetings, and Shader was impressed with Hornick's ability to push him to consider new directions. I got to see the other side of him, Shader says. It had just been overshadowed by how affable he is. Thanks in part to Hornick's advice, Shader's startup has taken off. It's called Painarm, and it enables Americans who don't have a bank account or a credit card to make online purchases with a barcode or a card, and then pay cash for them at participating establishments. Shader landed major partnerships with 7-Eleven and Greyhound to provide these services, and in the first year and a half since launching, Painarm has been growing at more than 30% per month. As an investor, Hornick has a small share in this growth. Hornick has also added Shader to his list of references, which is probably even more valuable than the deal itself. When entrepreneurs call to ask about Hornick, Shader tells them, you may be thinking he's just a nice guy, but he's a lot more than that. He's phenomenal, super hardworking and very courageous. He can be both challenging and supportive at the same time. And he's incredibly responsive, which is one of the best characteristics you can have in an investor. He'll get back to you any hour, day or night, quickly, on anything that matters. The payoff for Hornick was not limited to this single deal on Painarm. After seeing Hornick in action, Shader came to admire Hornick's commitment to acting in the best interests of entrepreneurs, and he began to set Hornick up with other investment opportunities. In one case, after meeting the CEO of a company called Rocket Lawyer, Shader recommended Hornick as an investor. Although the CEO already had a term sheet from another investor, Hornick ended up winning the investment. Although he recognizes the downsides, David Hornick believes that operating like a giver has been a driving force behind his success in venture capital. Hornick estimates that when most venture capitalists offer term sheets to entrepreneurs, they have a signing rate near 50%. If you get half of the deals you offer, you're doing pretty well. Yet in 11 years as a venture capitalist, Hornick has offered 28 term sheets to entrepreneurs, and 25 have accepted. Shader is one of just three people who have ever turned down an investment from Hornick. The other 89% of the time entrepreneurs have taken Hornick's money. Thanks to his funding and expert advice, these entrepreneurs have gone on to build a number of successful startups. One was valued at more than $3 billion on its first day of trading in 2012, and others have been acquired by Google, Oracle, Ticketmaster, and Monster. 
Hornick's hard work and talent, not to mention his luck at being on the right sideline at his daughter's soccer game, played a big part in lining up the deal with Danny Shader. But it was his reciprocity style that ended up winning the day for him. Even better, he wasn't the only winner. Shader won too, as did the companies to which Shader later recommended Hornick. By operating as a giver, Hornick created value for himself while maximizing opportunities for value to flow outward for the benefit of others. In this book, I want to persuade you that we underestimate the success of givers like David Hornick. Although we often stereotype givers as chumps and doormats, they turn out to be surprisingly successful. To figure out why givers dominate the top of the success ladder, we'll examine startling studies and stories that illuminate how giving can be more powerful, and less dangerous, than most people believe. Along the way, I'll introduce you to successful givers from many different walks of life, including consultants, lawyers, doctors, engineers, salespeople, writers, entrepreneurs, accountants, teachers, financial advisors, and sports executives. These givers reverse the popular plan of succeeding first and giving back later, raising the possibility that those who give first are often best positioned for success later. But we can't forget about those engineers and salespeople at the bottom of the ladder. Some givers do become pushovers and doormats, and I want to explore what separates the champs from the chumps. The answer is less about raw talent or aptitude, and more about the strategies givers use and the choices they make. To explain how givers avoid the bottom of the success ladder, I'm going to debunk two common myths about givers by showing you that they're not necessarily nice, and they're not necessarily altruistic. We all have goals for our own individual achievements, and it turns out that successful givers are every bit as ambitious as takers and matchers. They simply have a different way of pursuing their goals. This brings us to my third aim, which is to reveal what's unique about the success of givers. Let me be clear that givers, takers, and matchers all can, and do, achieve success. But there's something distinctive that happens when givers succeed, it spreads and cascades. When takers win, there's usually someone else who loses. Research shows that people tend to envy successful takers and look for ways to knock them down a notch. In contrast, when givers like David Hornick win, people are rooting for them and supporting them, rather than gunning for them. Givers succeed in a way that creates a ripple effect, enhancing the success of people around them. You'll see that the difference lies in how giver success creates value, instead of just claiming it. As the venture capitalist Randy Commissar remarks, it's easier to win if everybody wants you to win. If you don't make enemies out there, it's easier to succeed. But in some arenas, it seems that the costs of giving clearly outweigh the benefits. In politics, for example, Mark Twain's opening quote suggests that diplomacy involves taking ten times as much as giving. Politics, writes former President Bill Clinton, is a getting business. You have to get support, contributions, and votes, over and over again. Takers should have an edge in lobbying and outmaneuvering their opponents in competitive elections, and matchers may be well suited to the constant trading of favors that politics demands. What happens to givers in the world of politics? Consider the political struggles of a hick who went by the name Sampson. He said his goal was to be the Clinton of Illinois, and he set his sights on winning a seat in the Senate. Sampson was an unlikely candidate for political office, having spent his early years working on a farm. But Sampson had great ambition, he made his first run for a seat in the state legislature when he was just 23 years old. There were 13 candidates, and only the top four won seats. Sampson made a lackluster showing, finishing eighth. After losing that race, Sampson turned his eye to business, taking out a loan to start a small shop with a friend. The business failed, and Sampson was unable to repay the loan, so his possessions were seized by local authorities. Shortly thereafter, his business partner died without assets, and Sampson took on the debt. Sampson jokingly called his liability, the national debt, he owed 15 times his annual income. It would take him years, but he eventually paid back every cent. 
After his business failed, Sampson made a second run for the state legislature. Although he was only 25 years old, he finished second, landing a seat. For his first legislative session, he had to borrow the money to buy his first suit. For the next eight years, Sampson served in the state legislature, earning a law degree along the way. Eventually, at age 45, he was ready to pursue influence on the national stage. He made a bid for the Senate. Sampson knew he was fighting an uphill battle. He had two primary opponents, James Shields and Lyman Trumbull. Both had been state Supreme Court justices, coming from backgrounds far more privileged than Sampson's. Shields, the incumbent running for re-election, was the nephew of a congressman. Trumbull was the grandson of an eminent Yale-educated historian. By comparison, Sampson had little experience or political clout. In the first poll, Sampson was a surprise front-runner, with 44% support. Shields was close behind at 41%, and Trumbull was a distant third at 5%. In the next poll, Sampson gained ground, climbing to 47% support. But the tide began to turn when a new candidate entered the race, the state's current governor, Joel Matson. Matson was popular, and he had the potential to draw votes from both Sampson and Trumbull. When Shields withdrew from the race, Matson quickly took the lead. Matson had 44%, Sampson was down to 38%, and Trumbull was at just 9%. But hours later, Trumbull won the election with 51%, narrowly edging out Matson's 47%. Why did Sampson plummet, and how did Trumbull rise so quickly? The sudden reversal of their positions was due to a choice made by Sampson, who seemed plagued by pathological giving. When Matson entered the race, Sampson began to doubt his own ability to garner enough support to win. He knew that Trumbull had a small but loyal following who would not give up on him. Most people in Sampson's shoes would have lobbied Trumbull's followers to jump ship. After all, with just 9% support, Trumbull was a long shot. But Sampson's primary concern wasn't getting elected. It was to prevent Matson from winning. Sampson believed that Matson was engaging in questionable practices. Some onlookers had accused Matson of trying to bribe influential voters. At minimum, Sampson had reliable information that some of his own key supporters had been approached by Matson. If it appeared that Sampson would not stand a chance, Matson argued, the voters should shift their loyalties and support him. Sampson's concerns about Matson's methods and motives proved prescient. A year later, when Matson was finishing his term as governor, he redeemed old government checks that were outdated or had been previously redeemed, but were never cancelled. Matson took home several hundred thousand dollars and was indicted for fraud. In addition to harboring suspicions about Matson, Sampson believed in Trumbull, as they had something in common when it came to the issues. For several years, Sampson had campaigned passionately for a major shift in social and economic policy. He believed it was vital to the future of his state, and in this he and Trumbull were united. So instead of trying to convert Trumbull's loyal followers, Sampson decided to fall on his own sword. He told his floor manager, Stephen Logan, that he would withdraw from the race and ask his supporters to vote for Trumbull. Logan was incredulous. Why should the man with a larger following hand over the election to an adversary with a smaller following? Logan broke down into tears, but Sampson would not yield. He withdrew and asked his supporters to vote for Trumbull. It was enough to propel Trumbull to victory, at Sampson's expense. That was not the first time Sampson put the interests of others ahead of his own. Before he helped Trumbull win the Senate race, despite earning acclaim for his work as a lawyer, Sampson's success was stifled by a crushing liability. He could not bring himself to defend clients if he felt they were guilty. According to a colleague, Sampson's clients knew they would win their case, if it was fair, if not, that it was a waste of time to take it to him. In one case, a client was accused of theft, and Sampson approached the judge. If you can say anything for the man, do it, I can't. If I attempt it, the jury will see I think he is guilty, and convict him. 
In another case, during a criminal trial, Sampson leaned over and said to an associate, This man is guilty, you defend him, I can't. Sampson handed the case over to the associate, walking away from a sizable fee. These decisions earned him respect, but they raised questions about whether he was tenacious enough to make tough political decisions. Sampson, comes very near being a perfect man, said one of his political rivals. He lacks but one thing. The rival explained that Sampson was unfit to be trusted with power, because his judgment was too easily clouded by concern for others. In politics, operating like a giver put Sampson at a disadvantage. His reluctance to put himself first cost him the Senate election, and left onlookers wondering whether he was strong enough for the unforgiving world of politics. Trumbull was a fierce debater, Sampson was a pushover. I regret my defeat, Sampson admitted, but he maintained that Trumbull's election would help to advance the causes they shared. After the election, a local reporter wrote that in comparison with Sampson, Trumbull was a man of more real talent and power. But Sampson wasn't ready to step aside forever. Four years after helping Lyman Trumbull win the seat, Sampson ran for the Senate again. He lost again. But in the weeks leading up to the vote, one of the most outspoken supporters of Sampson's was none other than Lyman Trumbull. Sampson's sacrifice had earned goodwill, and Trumbull was not the only adversary who became an advocate in response to Sampson's giving. In the first Senate race, when Sampson had 47% of the vote and seemed to be on the brink of victory, a Chicago lawyer and politician named Norman Judd led a strong 5% who would not waver in their loyalty to Trumbull. During Sampson's second Senate bid, Judd became a strong supporter. Two years later, after two failed Senate races, Sampson finally won his first election at the national level. According to one commentator, Judd never forgot Sampson's generous behavior, and did, more than anyone else, to secure Sampson's nomination. In 1999, C-SPAN, the cable TV network that covers politics, polled more than a thousand knowledgeable viewers. They rated the effectiveness of Sampson and three dozen other politicians who vied for similar offices. Sampson came out at the very top of the poll, receiving the highest evaluations. Despite his losses, he was more popular than any other politician on the list. You see, Sampson's ghost was a pen name that the Hick used in letters. His real name was Abraham Lincoln. In the 1830s, Lincoln was striving to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois, referencing a U.S. senator and New York governor who spearheaded the construction of the Erie Canal. When Lincoln withdrew from his first Senate race to help Lyman Trumbull win the seat, they shared a commitment to abolishing slavery. From emancipating slaves, to sacrificing his own political opportunities for the cause, to refusing to defend clients who appeared to be guilty, Lincoln consistently acted for the greater good. When experts in history, political science, and psychology rated the presidents, they identified Lincoln as a clear giver. Even if it was inconvenient, Lincoln went out of his way to help others, wrote two experts, demonstrating, obvious concern for the well-being of individual citizens. It is noteworthy that Lincoln is seen as one of the least self-centered, egotistical, boastful presidents ever. In independent ratings of presidential biographies, Lincoln scored in the top three, along with Washington and Fillmore, in giving credit to others and acting in the best interests of others. In the words of a military general who worked with Lincoln, he seemed to possess more of the elements of greatness, combined with goodness, than any other. In the Oval Office, Lincoln was determined to put the good of the nation above his own ego. When he won the presidency in 1860, he invited the three candidates whom he defeated for the Republican nomination to become his Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, and Attorney General. In Team of Rivals, the historian Doris Kearns Goodwin documents how unusual Lincoln's cabinet was. Every member of the administration was better known, better educated, and more experienced in public life than Lincoln. Their presence in the cabinet might have threatened to eclipse the obscure prairie lawyer. In Lincoln's position, a taker might have preferred to protect his ego and power by inviting, yes men, to join him. 
a matcher might have offered appointments to allies who had supported him. Yet Lincoln invited his bitter competitors instead. We needed the strongest man of the party in the cabinet, Lincoln told an incredulous reporter. I had no right to deprive the country of their services. Some of these rivals despised Lincoln, and others viewed him as incompetent, but he managed to win them all over. According to Kearns Goodwin, Lincoln's success in dealing with the strong egos of the men in his cabinet suggests that in the hands of a truly great politician the qualities we generally associate with decency and morality, kindness, sensitivity, compassion, honesty, and empathy, can also be impressive political resources. If politics can be fertile ground for givers, it's possible that givers can succeed in any job. Whether giving is effective, though, depends on the particular kind of exchange in which it's employed. This is one important feature of giving to keep in mind as we move through the ideas in this book. On any particular morning, giving may well be incompatible with success. In purely zero-sum situations and win-lose interactions, giving rarely pays off. This is a lesson that Abraham Lincoln learned each time he chose to give to others at his own expense. If I have one vice, Lincoln said, and I can call it nothing else, it is not to be able to say no. But most of life isn't zero-sum, and on balance, people who choose giving as their primary reciprocity style end up reaping rewards. For Lincoln, like David Hornick, seemingly self-sacrificing decisions ultimately worked to his advantage. When we initially concluded that Lincoln and Hornick lost, we hadn't stretched the time horizons out far enough. It takes time for givers to build goodwill and trust, but eventually, they establish reputations and relationships that enhance their success. In fact, you'll see that in sales and medical school, the giver advantage grows over time. In the long run, giving can be every bit as powerful as it is dangerous. As Chip Conley, the renowned entrepreneur who founded Joie de Vivre Hotels, explains, being a giver is not good for a 100-yard dash, but it's valuable in a marathon. In Lincoln's era, the marathon took a long time to run. Without telephones, the internet, and high-speed transportation, building relationships and reputations was a slow process. In the old world, you could send a letter, and no one knew, Conley says. Conley believes that in today's connected world, where relationships and reputations are more visible, givers can accelerate their pace. You no longer have to choose, says Bobby Silton, the former president of Dockers, who now runs global social and environmental responsibility for Gap Inc. You can be a giver and be successful. The fact that the long run is getting shorter isn't the only force that makes giving more professionally productive today. We live in an era when massive changes in the structure of work, and the technology that shapes it, have further amplified the advantages of being a giver. Today, more than half of American and European companies regularly use Teams to get work done. We rely on Teams to build cars and houses, perform surgeries, fly planes, fight wars, play symphonies, produce news reports, audit companies, and provide consulting services. Teams depend on givers to share information, volunteer for unpopular tasks, and provide help. When Lincoln invited his rivals to join his cabinet, they had the chance to see firsthand how much he was willing to contribute for the sake of other people and his country. Several years before Lincoln became president, one of his rivals, Edwin Stanton, had rejected him as a co-counsel in a trial, calling him a gawky, long-armed ape. Yet after working with Lincoln, Stanton described him as, the most perfect ruler of men the world has ever seen. As we organize more people into teams, givers have more opportunities to demonstrate their value, as Lincoln did. Even if you don't work in a team, odds are that you hold a service job. Most of our grandparents worked in independent jobs producing goods. They didn't always need to collaborate with other people, so it was fairly inefficient to be a giver. But now, a high percentage of people work in interconnected jobs providing services to others. In the 1980s, the service sector made up about half of the world's gross domestic product GDP. 
By 1995, the service sector was responsible for nearly two-thirds of world GDP. Today, more than 80% of Americans work in service jobs. As the service sector continues to expand, more and more people are placing a premium on providers who have established relationships and reputations as givers. Whether your reciprocity style is primarily giver, taker, or matcher, I'm willing to bet that you want your key service providers to be givers. You hope your doctor, lawyer, teacher, dentist, plumber, and real estate agent will focus on contributing value to you, not on claiming value from you. This is why David Hornick has an 89% success rate. Entrepreneurs know that when he offers to invest in their companies, he has their best interests at heart. Whereas many venture capitalists don't consider unsolicited pitches, preferring to spend their scarce time on people and ideas that have already shown promise, Hornick responds personally to emails from complete strangers. I'm happy to be as helpful as I can independent of whether I have some economic interest, he says. According to Hornick, a successful venture capitalist is a service provider. Entrepreneurs are not here to serve venture capitalists. We are here to serve entrepreneurs. The rise of the service economy sheds light on why givers have the worst grades and the best grades in medical school. In the study of Belgian medical students, the givers earned significantly lower grades in their first year of medical school. The givers were at a disadvantage, and the negative correlation between giver scores and grades was stronger than the effect of smoking on the odds of getting lung cancer. But that was the only year of medical school in which the givers underperformed. By their second year, the givers had made up the gap, they were now slightly outperforming their peers. By the sixth year, the givers earned substantially higher grades than their peers. A giver style, measured six years earlier, was a better predictor of medical school grades than the effect of smoking on lung cancer rates and the effect of using nicotine patches on quitting smoking. By the seventh year of medical school, when the givers became doctors, they had climbed still further ahead. The effect of giving on final medical school performance was stronger than the smoking effects above, it was even greater than the effect of drinking alcohol on aggressive behavior. Why did the giver disadvantage reverse, becoming such a strong advantage? Nothing about the givers changed, but their program did. As students progress through medical school, they move from independent classes into clinical rotations, internships, and patient care. The further they advance, the more their success depends on teamwork and service. As the structure of classwork shifts, the givers benefit from their natural tendencies to collaborate effectively with other medical professionals and express concern to patients. This giver advantage in service roles is hardly limited to medicine. Steve Jones, the award-winning former CEO of one of the largest banks in Australia, wanted to know what made financial advisors successful. His team studied key factors such as financial expertise and effort. But, the single most influential factor, Jones told me, was whether a financial advisor had the client's best interests at heart, above the company's and even his own. It was one of my three top priorities to get that value instilled, and demonstrate that it's in everybody's best interests to treat clients that way. One financial advisor who exemplifies this giver style is Peter Odette, a broad-shouldered Aussie who once wore a mullet and has an affinity for Bon Jovi. He began his career as a customer service representative answering phones for a large insurance company. The first year after he was hired, Peter won the Personality of the Year award, beating out hundreds of other employees based on his passion for helping customers, and became the youngest department supervisor in the whole company. Years later, when Peter joined a group of 15 executives for a give-and-take exercise, the average executive offered help to three colleagues. Peter offered help to all 15 of them. He is such a giver that he even tries to help the job applicants he doesn't hire, spending hours making connections for them to find other opportunities. In 2011, when Peter was working as a financial advisor, he received a call from an Australian client. The client wanted to make changes to a small superannuation fund valued at $70,000. 
A staff member was assigned to the client, but looked him up and saw that he was a scrap metal worker. Thinking like a matcher, the staff member declined to make the visit. It was a waste of his time. It certainly wasn't worth Peter's time. He specialized in high net worth clients, whose funds were worth a thousand times more money, and his largest client had more than $100 million. If you calculated the dollar value of Peter's time, the scrap metal workers fund was not even worth the amount of time it would take to drive out to his house. He was the tiniest client, and no one wanted to see him, it was beneath everybody, Peter reflects. But you can't just ignore someone because you don't think they're important enough. Peter scheduled an appointment to drive out to see the scrap metal worker and help him with the plan changes. When he pulled up to the house, his jaw dropped. The front door was covered in cobwebs and had not been opened in months. He drove around to the back, where a 34-year-old man opened the door. The living room was full of bugs, and he could see straight through to the roof, the entire ceiling had been ripped out. The client made a feeble gesture to some folding chairs, and Peter began working through the client's plan changes. Feeling sympathy for the client, who seemed like an earnest, hard-working blue-collar man, Peter made a generous offer. While I'm here, why don't you tell me a bit about yourself and I'll see if there's anything else I can help you with. The client mentioned a love of cars, and walked him around back to a dingy shed. Peter braced himself for another depressing display of poverty, envisioning a pile of rusted metal. When Peter stepped inside the shed, he gasped. Spread out before him in immaculate condition were a first-generation Chevy Camaro, built in 1966, two vintage Australian Valiant cars with 1,000-horsepower engines for drag racing, a souped-up coupe utility car, and a Ford coupe from the movie Mad Max. The client was not a scrap metal worker, he owned a lucrative scrap metal business. He had just bought the house to fix it up, it was on 11 acres, and it cost $1.4 million. Peter spent the next year re-engineering the client's business, improving his tax position, and helping him renovate the house. All I did was start out by doing a kindness, Peter notes. When I got to work the next day, I had to laugh at my colleague who wasn't prepared to give a bit by driving out to visit the client. Peter went on to develop a strong relationship with the client, whose fees multiplied by a factor of a hundred the following year, and expects to continue working with him for decades. Over the course of his career, giving has enabled Peter Odette to access opportunities that takers and matchers routinely miss, but it has also cost him dearly. As you'll see in Chapter 7, he was exploited by two takers who nearly put him out of business. Yet Peter managed to climb from the bottom to the top of the success ladder, becoming one of the more productive financial advisors in Australia. The key, he believes, was learning to harness the benefits of giving while minimizing the costs. As a managing director at Genesis Wealth Advisors, he managed to rescue his firm from the brink of bankruptcy and turn it into an industry leader, and he chalks his success up to being a giver. There's no doubt that I've succeeded in business because I give to other people. It's my weapon of choice, Peter says. When I'm head to head with another advisor to try and win business, people tell me this is why I win. Although technological and organizational changes have made giving more advantageous, there's one feature of giving that's more timeless. When we reflect on our guiding principles in life, many of us are intuitively drawn to giving. Over the past three decades, the esteemed psychologist Shalom Schwartz has studied the values and guiding principles that matter to people in different cultures around the world. One of his studies surveyed reasonably representative samples of thousands of adults in Australia, Chile, Finland, France, Germany, Israel, Malaysia, the Netherlands, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, and the United States. He translated his survey into a dozen languages, and asked respondents to rate the importance of different values. Here are a few examples. List 1. Wealth, money, material possessions. Power, dominance, control over others. Pleasure, enjoying life. Winning, doing better than others. List 2. Helpfulness, working for the well-being of others. 
Responsibility being dependable. Social justice caring for the disadvantaged. Compassion responding to the needs of others. Takers favor the values in list 1, whereas givers prioritize the values in list 2. Schwartz wanted to know where most people would endorse giver values. Take a look back at the 12 countries above. Where do the majority of people endorse giver values above taker values? All of them. In all 12 countries, most people rate giving as their single most important value. They report caring more about giving than about power, achievement, excitement, freedom, tradition, conformity, security, and pleasure. In fact, this was true in more than 70 different countries around the world. Giver values are the number one guiding principle in life to most people in most countries, from Argentina to Armenia, Belgium to Brazil, and Slovakia to Singapore. In the majority of the world's cultures, including that of the United States, the majority of people endorse giving as their single most important guiding principle. On some level, this comes as no surprise. As parents, we read our children books like The Giving Tree and emphasize the importance of sharing and caring. But we tend to compartmentalize giving, reserving a different set of values for the sphere of work. We may love Shel Silverstein for our kids, but the popularity of books like Robert Greene's The 48 Laws of Power, not to mention the fascination of many business gurus with Sun Tzu's The Art of War, suggests that we don't see much room for giver values in our professional lives. As a result, even people who operate like givers at work are often afraid to admit it. In the summer of 2011, I met a woman named Sherry Ann Pless, an executive at a prestigious financial services firm. Sherry Ann was clearly a giver. She spent countless hours mentoring junior colleagues and volunteered to head up a women's leadership initiative and a major charitable fundraising initiative at her firm. My default is to give, she says. I'm not looking for quid pro quo, I'm looking to make a difference and have an impact, and I focus on the people who can benefit from my help the most. To enrich her business acumen, Sherry Ann left her job for six weeks, enrolling in a leadership program with 60 executives from companies around the world. To identify her strengths, she underwent a comprehensive psychological assessment. Sherry Ann was shocked to learn that her top professional strengths were kindness and compassion. Fearing that the results would jeopardize her reputation as a tough and successful leader, Sherry Ann decided not to tell anyone. I didn't want to sound like a flake. I was afraid people would perceive me differently, perhaps as a less serious executive, Sherry Ann confided. I was conditioned to leave my human feelings at the door, and win. I want my primary skills to be seen as hardworking and results-oriented, not kindness and compassion. In business, sometimes you have to wear different masks. The fear of being judged as weak or naive prevents many people from operating like givers at work. Many people who hold giver values in life choose matching as their primary reciprocity style at work, seeking an even balance of give and take. In one study, people completed a survey about whether their default approach to work relationships was to give, take, or match. Only 8% described themselves as givers, the other 92% were not willing to contribute more than they received at work. In another study, I found that in the office, more than three times as many people prefer to be matchers than givers. People who prefer to give or match often feel pressured to lean in the taker direction when they perceive a workplace as zero-sum. Whether it's a company with forced ranking systems, a group of firms vying to win the same clients, or a school with required grading curves and more demand than supply for desirable jobs, it's only natural to assume that peers will lean more toward taking than giving. When they anticipate self-interested behavior from others, explains the Stanford psychologist Dale Miller, People fear that they'll be exploited if they operate like givers, so they conclude that, pursuing a competitive orientation is the rational and appropriate thing to do. There's even evidence that just putting on a business suit and analyzing a Harvard Business School case is enough to significantly reduce the attention that people pay to relationships and the interests of others. The fear of exploitation by takers is so pervasive, writes the Cornell economist Robert Frank. 
that, by encouraging us to expect the worst in others it brings out the worst in us, dreading the role of the chump, we are often loath to heed our nobler instincts. Giving is especially risky when dealing with takers, and David Hornick believes that many of the world's most successful venture capitalists operate like takers, they insist on disproportionately large shares of entrepreneurs' startups and claim undue credit when their investments prove successful. Hornick is determined to change these norms. When a financial planner asked him what he wanted to achieve in life, Hornick said that, Above all, I want to demonstrate that success doesn't have to come at someone else's expense. In an attempt to prove it, Hornick has broken two of the most sacred rules in the venture business. In 2004, he became the first venture capitalist to start a blog. Venture capital was a black box, so Hornick invited entrepreneurs inside. He began to share information openly online, helping entrepreneurs to improve their pitches by gaining a deeper understanding of how venture capitalists think. Hornick's partners, and his firm's general counsel, discouraged him from doing it. Why would he want to give away trade secrets? If other investors read his blog, they could steal ideas without sharing any in return. The idea of a venture capitalist talking about what he was doing was considered insane, Hornick reflects. But I really wanted to engage in a conversation with a broad set of entrepreneurs and be helpful to them. His critics were right. Lots of venture capitalists ended up reading it. When I talked about specific companies I was excited about, getting deals became more competitive. But that was a price that Hornick was willing to pay. My focus was entirely on creating value for entrepreneurs, he says, and he has maintained the blog for the past eight years. Hornick's second unconventional move was ignited by his frustration with dull speakers at conferences. Back in college, he had teamed up with a professor to run a speaker's bureau so he could invite interesting people to campus. The lineup included the inventor of the game Dungeons and Dragons, the world yo-yo champion, and the animator who created the Wile E. Coyote and Road Runner cartoon characters for Warner Brothers. By comparison, speakers at venture capital and technology conferences weren't measuring up. I discovered that I stopped going in to hear the speakers, and I would spend all my time chatting with people in the lobby about what they're working on. The real value of these events was the conversations and relationships that were created between people. What if a conference was about conversations and relationships, not content? In 2007, Hornick planned his first annual conference. It was called The Lobby, and the goal was to bring entrepreneurs together to share ideas about new media. Hornick was putting about $400,000 on the line, and people tried to talk him out of it. You could destroy your firm's reputation, they warned, hinting that if the conference failed, Hornick's own career might be ruined. But he pressed forward, and when it was time to send out invitations, Hornick did the unthinkable. He invited venture capitalists at rival firms to attend the conference. Several colleagues thought he was out of his mind. Why in the world would you let other venture capitalists come to the conference? They asked. If Hornick met an entrepreneur with a hot new idea at the lobby, he would have a leg up on landing the investment. Why would he want to give away his advantage and help his competitors find opportunities? Once again, Hornick ignored the naysayers. I want to create an experience to benefit everyone, not just me. One of the rival venture capitalists who attended liked the format so much that he created his own lobby-style conference, but he didn't invite Hornick, or any other venture capitalists. His partners wouldn't let him. Nevertheless, Hornick kept inviting venture capitalists to the lobby. David Hornick recognizes the costs of operating like a giver. Some people think I'm delusional. They believe the way you achieve is by being a taker, he says. If he were more of a taker, he probably wouldn't accept unsolicited pitches, respond personally to emails, share information with competitors on his blog, or invite his rivals to benefit from the lobby conference. He would protect his time, guard his knowledge, and leverage his connections more carefully.
And if he were more of a matcher, he would have asked for quid pro quo with the venture capitalist who attended the lobby but didn't invite Hornick to his own conference. But Hornick pays more attention to what other people need than to what he gets from them. Hornick has been extremely successful as a venture capitalist while living by his values, and he's widely respected for his generosity. It's a win-win, Hornick reflects. I get to create an environment where other people can get deals and build relationships, and I live in the world I want to live in. His experience reinforces that giving not only is professionally risky, it can also be professionally rewarding. Understanding what makes giving both powerful and dangerous is the focus of give and take. The first section unveils the principles of giver success, illuminating how and why givers rise to the top. I'll show you how successful givers have unique approaches to interactions in four key domains, networking, collaborating, evaluating, and influencing. A close look at networking highlights fresh approaches for developing connections with new contacts and strengthening ties with old contacts. Examining collaboration reveals what it takes to work productively with colleagues and earn their respect. Exploring how we evaluate others offers counterintuitive techniques for judging and developing talent to get the best results out of others. And an analysis of influence sheds light on novel strategies for presenting, selling, persuading, and negotiating, all in the spirit of convincing others to support our ideas and interests. Across these four domains, you'll see what successful givers do differently, and what takers and matchers can learn from their approach. Along the way, you'll find out how America's best networker developed his connections, why the genius behind one of the most successful shows in television history toiled for years in anonymity, how a basketball executive responsible for some of the worst draft busts in history turned things around, whether a lawyer who stumbles on his words can beat a lawyer who speaks with confidence, and how you can spot a taker just from looking at a Facebook profile. In the second part of the book, the focus shifts from the benefits of giving to the costs, and how they can be managed. I'll examine how givers protect themselves against burnout and avoid becoming pushovers and doormats. You'll discover how a teacher reduced her burnout by giving more rather than less, how a billionaire made money by giving it away, and the ideal number of hours to volunteer if you want to become happier and live longer. You'll see why giving slowed one consultant's path to partner but accelerated another's, why we misjudge who's a giver and who's a taker, and how givers protect themselves at the bargaining table. You'll also gain knowledge about how givers avoid the bottom of the success ladder and rise to the top by nudging other people away from taking and toward giving. You'll learn about a 90-minute activity that unleashes giving in remarkable ways, and you'll figure out why people give things away for free that they could easily sell for a profit on Craigslist, why some radiologists get better but others get worse, why thinking about Superman makes people less likely to volunteer, and why people named Dennis are unusually likely to become dentists. By the time you finish reading this book, you may be reconsidering some of your fundamental assumptions about success. If you're a self-sacrificing giver, you'll find plenty of insights for ascending from the bottom to the top of the success ladder. If you endorse giver values but act like a matcher at work, you may be pleasantly surprised by the wealth of opportunities to express your values and find meaning in helping others without compromising your own success. Instead of aiming to succeed first and give back later, you might decide that giving first is a promising path to succeeding later. And if you currently lean toward taking, you may just be tempted to shift in the giver direction, seeking to master the skills of this growing breed of people who achieve success by contributing to others. But if you do it only to succeed, it probably won't work. 2. The Peacock and the Panda how Givers, Takers, and Matchers Build Networks. Every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights leader and Nobel Peace Prize winner. Several decades ago, a man who started his life in poverty lived the American dream. He came from humble beginnings, growing up in Missouri farm towns without indoor plumbing. To help support his family, the young man worked long hours on farms and paper routes. 
He put himself through college at the University of Missouri, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and completed a master's degree and then a doctorate in economics. He pursued a life of public service, enlisting in the Navy and then serving in several important roles in the U.S. government, earning the Navy Commendation Medal and National Defense Service Medal. From there, he built his own company, where he was chairman and CEO for 15 years. By the time he stepped down, his company was worth $110 billion, with more than 20,000 employees in 40 countries around the world. For five consecutive years, Fortune named his company, America's most innovative company, and one of the 25 best places to work in the country. When asked about his success, he acknowledged the importance of respect. The Golden Rule. Absolute Integrity. Everyone knows that I personally have a very strict code of personal conduct that I live by. He set up a charitable family foundation, giving over $2.5 million to more than 250 organizations, and donated 1% of his company's annual profits to charity. His giving attracted the attention of former President George W. Bush, who commended him as a good guy and a generous person. Then he was indicted. His name was Kenneth Lay, and he is best remembered as a primary villain in the Enron scandal. Enron was an energy, commodities, and securities firm headquartered in Houston. In October 2001, Enron lost $1.2 billion in shareholder equity after reporting third-quarter losses of $618 million, the biggest earnings restatement in U.S. history. In December, Enron went bankrupt, leaving 20,000 employees jobless, many watching their life savings practically erased by the company's fall. Investigators found that Enron had deceived investors by reporting false profits and hiding debts of more than $1 billion, manipulated energy and power markets in California and Texas, and won international contracts by giving illegal bribes to foreign governments. Lay was convicted on six counts of conspiracy and fraud. We can debate about how much Lay truly knew about Enron's illegal activities, but it's difficult to deny that he was a taker. Although Lay may have looked like a giver to many observers, he was a faker, a taker in disguise. Lay felt entitled to use Enron's resources for personal gain. As Bethany McLean and Peter Ilkind describe in The Smartest Guys in the Room, Lay took exorbitant loans from the company and had his staff put his sandwiches on silver platters and fine china. A secretary once tried to reserve an Enron plane for an executive to do business, only to learn that the Lay family was currently using three Enron planes for personal travel. From 1997 to 1998, $4.5 million in Enron commissions went to a travel agency owned by Lay's sister. According to accusations, he sold more than $70 million in stock just before Enron went bankrupt, taking the treasure from a sinking ship. This behavior was foreshadowed in the 1970s when Lay worked at Exxon. A boss wrote a reference recommending Lay highly, but warned that he was, maybe too ambitious. Observers now believe that as early as 1987, at Enron Oil, Lay approved and helped to conceal the activities of two traders who set up fake companies and stole $3.8 million while allowing Enron to avoid massive trading losses. When the losses were discovered, Enron Oil had to report an $85 million hit, and Lay denied knowledge and responsibility, if anyone could say that I knew, let them stand up. According to McLean and Ilkind, one trader started to stand up but was physically restrained by two colleagues. How did a taker end up becoming so successful? He knew somebody. In fact, he knew a whole lot of somebodies. Ken Lay profited greatly from claiming his company's financial resources as his own, but much of his success in growing that company came the old-fashioned way. He built a network of influential contacts and leveraged them for his own benefit. Lay was a master networker from the start. In college, he impressed an economics professor named Pinckney Walker and started his ascent on the shoulders of Walker's connections. Walker helped Lay land an assignment as an economist at the Pentagon, and then a position as a chief assistant in the White House in the Nixon administration.
By the mid-1980s, Lay became the head of Enron after engineering the company's move to Houston following a merger. As he consolidated his power, he began to hobnob with political power brokers who could support Enron's interests. He put Pinckney Walker's brother Charles on Enron's board and developed a relationship with George H. W. Bush, who was running for president. In 1990, Lay co-chaired an important summit of industrialized nations meeting for Bush in Houston, putting on a dazzling show and charming the crowd, which included British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, and French President François Mitterrand. After Bush lost his re-election bid to Bill Clinton, Lay wasted no time in reaching out to a friend who was a key aide to the president-elect, the friend had gone to kindergarten with Clinton. Soon, Lay was playing golf with the new president. Several years later, as George W. Bush gained power, Lay used his connections to lobby for energy deregulation and get his supporters in important government positions in Texas and the White House, influencing policies in Enron's favor. At nearly every stage in his career, Lay was able to dramatically improve his company's prospects, or his own, by making use of well-placed contacts in his network. For centuries, we have recognized the importance of networking. According to Brian Uzi, a management professor at Northwestern University, networks come with three major advantages, private information, diverse skills, and power. By developing a strong network, people can gain invaluable access to knowledge, expertise, and influence. Extensive research demonstrates that people with rich networks achieve higher performance ratings, get promoted faster, and earn more money. And because networks are based on interactions and relationships, they serve as a powerful prism for understanding the impact of reciprocity styles on success. How do people relate to others in their networks, and what do they see as the purpose of networking? On the one hand, the very notion of networking often has negative connotations. When we meet a new person who expresses enthusiasm about connecting, we frequently wonder whether he's acting friendly because he's genuinely interested in a relationship that will benefit both of us, or because he wants something from us. At some point in your life, you've probably experienced the frustration of dealing with slick schmoozers who are nice to your face when they want a favor, but end up stabbing you in the back or simply ignoring you, after they get what they want. This faker style of networking casts the entire enterprise as Machiavellian, a self-serving activity in which people make connections for the sole purpose of advancing their own interests. On the other hand, givers and matchers often see networking as an appealing way to connect with new people and ideas. We meet many people throughout our professional and personal lives, and since we all have different knowledge and resources, it makes sense to turn to these people to exchange help, advice, and introductions. This raises a fundamental question, can people build up networks that have breadth and depth using different reciprocity styles? Or does one style consistently create a richer network? In this chapter, I want to examine how givers, takers, and matchers develop fundamentally distinct networks, and why their interactions within these networks have different characters and consequences. You'll see how givers and takers build and manage their networks differently, and learn about some clues that they leak along the way, including how we could have recognized the takers at Enron four years before the company collapsed. Ultimately, I want to argue that while givers and takers may have equally large networks, givers are able to produce far more lasting value through their networks, and in ways that might not seem obvious. In 2011, Fortune conducted extensive research to identify the best networker in the United States. The goal was to use online social networks to figure out who had the most connections to America's most powerful people. The staff compiled a list of the Fortune 500 CEOs, as well as Fortune's lists of the 50 smartest people in technology, the 50 most powerful women, and the 40 hottest rising stars in business under age 40. Then, they cross-referenced this list of 640 powerful people against LinkedIn's entire database of more than 90 million members. The winning networker was connected on LinkedIn to more of Fortune's 640 movers and shakers than anyone else on Earth. 
The winner had more than 3,000 LinkedIn connections, including Netscape co-founder Mark Andreessen, Twitter co-founder Evan Williams, Flickr co-founder Katerina Fake, Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskovitz, Napster co-founder Sean Parker, and Half.com founder Josh Kopelman, not to mention the former chef of the Grateful Dead. As you'll see later, this networker extraordinaire is a giver. It seems counterintuitive, but the more altruistic your attitude, the more benefits you will gain from the relationship, writes LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman. If you set out to help others, he explains, you will rapidly reinforce your own reputation and expand your universe of possibilities. Part of this, I'll argue, has to do with the way networks themselves have changed and are still evolving. At the heart of my inquiry, though, lies an exploration of how the motives with which we approach networking shape the strength and reach of those networks, as well as the way that energy flows through them. Spotting the taker in a giver's clothes. If you've ever put your guard up when meeting a new colleague, it's probably because you thought you picked up on the scent of self-serving motives. When we see a taker coming, we protect ourselves by closing the door to our networks, withholding our trust and help. To avoid getting shut out, many takers become good fakers, acting generously so that they can waltz into our networks disguised as givers or matchers. For the better part of two decades, this worked for Ken Lay, whose favors and charitable contributions enabled people to see him in a positive light, opening the door to new ties and sources of help. But it can be difficult for takers to keep up the facade in all of their interactions. Ken Lay was charming when mingling with powerful people in Washington, but many of his peers and subordinates saw through him. Looking back, one former Enron employee said, if you wanted to get Lay to attend a meeting, you needed to invite someone important. There's a Dutch phrase that captures this duality beautifully, kissing up, kicking down. Although takers tend to be dominant and controlling with subordinates, they're surprisingly submissive and deferential toward superiors. When takers deal with powerful people, they become convincing fakers. Takers want to be admired by influential superiors, so they go out of their way to charm and flatter. As a result, powerful people tend to form glowing first impressions of takers. A trio of German psychologists found that when strangers first encountered people, the ones they liked most were those, with a sense of entitlement and a tendency to manipulate and exploit others. When kissing up, takers are often good fakers. In 1998, when Wall Street analysts visited Enron, Lay recruited 70 employees to pretend to be busy traders, hoping to wow the analysts with the image of a productive energy trading business. Lay led the analysts through the charade, where the employees were asked to bring personal photos to a different floor of the building so it looked like they worked there, and put on a show. They made imaginary phone calls, creating a ruse that they were busy buying and selling energy and gas. This is another sign that Lay was a taker. He was obsessed with making a good impression upward, but worried less about how he was seen by those below him. As Samuel Johnson purportedly wrote, the true measure of a man is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. Takers may rise by kissing up, but they often fall by kicking down. When Lay sought to impress the Wall Street analysts, he did so by exploiting his own employees, asking them to compromise their integrity to construct a facade that would deceive the analysts. Research shows that as people gain power, they feel large and in charge, less constrained and freer to express their natural tendencies. As takers gain power, they pay less attention to how they're perceived by those below and next to them, they feel entitled to pursue self-serving goals and claim as much value as they can. Over time, treating peers and subordinates poorly jeopardizes their relationships and reputations. After all, most people are matchers, their core values emphasize fairness, equality, and reciprocity. When takers violate these principles, matchers in their networks believe in an eye for an eye, so they want to see justice served. To illustrate, imagine that you're participating in a famous study led by Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize-winning psychologist at Princeton. You're playing what's known as the ultimatum game, and you sit down across the table from a stranger who has just been given $10. 
His task is to present you with a proposal about how the money will be divided between the two of you. It's an ultimatum. You can either accept the proposal as it stands and split the money as proposed, or you can reject it, and both of you will get nothing. You might never see each other again, so he acts like a taker, keeping $8 and offering you only $2. What do you do? In terms of pure profit, it's rational for you to accept the offer. After all, $2 is better than nothing. But if you're like most people, you reject it. You're willing to sacrifice the money to punish the taker for being unfair, walking away with nothing just to keep him from earning $8. Evidence shows that the vast majority of people in this position reject proposals that are imbalanced to the tune of 80% or more for the divider. Asterisk. Why do we punish takers for being unfair? It's not spite. We're not getting revenge on takers for trying to take advantage of us. It's about justice. If you're a matcher, you'll also punish takers for acting unfairly toward other people. In another study spearheaded by Kahneman, people had a choice between splitting $12 evenly with a taker who had made an unfair proposal in the past or splitting $10 evenly with a matcher who had made a fair proposal in the past. More than 80% of the people preferred to split $10 evenly with the matcher, accepting $5 rather than $6 to prevent the taker from getting $6. In networks, new research shows that when people get burned by takers, they punish them by sharing reputational information. Gossip represents a widespread, efficient, and low-cost form of punishment, write the social scientists Matthew Feinberg, Joey Cheng, and Rob Willer. When reputational information suggests that someone has taker tendencies, we can withhold trust and avoid being exploited. Over time, as their reputation spread, takers end up cutting existing ties and burning bridges with potential new ties. When Lay's taking was revealed, many of his former supporters, including the Bush family, distanced themselves from him. As Wayne Baker, a University of Michigan sociologist and networking expert, explains, if we create networks with the sole intention of getting something, we won't succeed. We can't pursue the benefits of networks, the benefits ensue from investments in meaningful activities and relationships. Before we make the leap of investing in relationships, though, we need to be able to recognize takers in our everyday interactions. For many of us, a challenge of networking lies in trying to guess the motives or intentions of a new contact, especially since we've seen that takers can be quite adept at posing as givers when there's a potential return. Is the next person you meet interested in a genuine connection or merely seeking personal gains, and is there a good way to tell the difference? Luckily, research shows that takers leak clues. Well, more precisely, takers leck clues. In the animal kingdom, lecking refers to a ritual in which males show off their desirability as mates. When it's time to breed, they gather in a common place and take their established positions. They put on extravagant displays to impress and court female audiences. Some do mating dances. Some sing alluring songs. Some even do acrobatics. The most striking display of lecking occurs among male peacocks. Each mating season, the males assume their positions and begin parading their plumage. They strut. They spread their feathers. They spin around to flaunt their tails. In the CEO kingdom, takers do a dance that looks remarkably similar. In a landmark study, strategy professors Arijit Chatterjee and Donald Hambrick studied more than 100 CEOs in computer hardware and software companies. They analyzed each company's annual reports over more than a decade, looking for signs of lecking. What they found would forever change the face of leadership. It turns out that we could have anticipated the collapse of Enron as early as 1997, without ever meeting Ken Lay or looking at a single number. The warning signs of Enron's demise are visible in a single image, captured four years before the company unraveled. Take a look at the two pictures of CEOs below, reproduced from their company's annual reports. Both men started their lives in poverty, worked in the Nixon administration, founded their own companies, became rich CEOs, and donated substantial sums of money to charity. Can you tell from their faces, or their clothes, which one was a taker? 
The man on the left is John Huntsman Sr., a giver whom we'll meet in Chapter 6, from his company's 2006 annual report. The photo on the right depicts Ken Lay. Thousands of experts have analyzed Enron's financial statements, but they've missed an important fact. A picture really is worth a thousand words. Had we looked more carefully at the Enron reports, we might have recognized the telltale signs of takers lecking at the helm. But these signs aren't where I expected to find them, they're not in the faces or attire of the CEOs. In their study of CEOs in the computer industry, Chatterjee and Hambrick had a hunch that takers would see themselves as the suns in their company's solar systems. They found several clues of takers lecking at the top. One signal appeared in CEO interviews. Since takers tend to be self-absorbed, they're more likely to use first-person singular pronouns like I, me, mine, my, and myself, versus first-person plural pronouns like we, us, our, ours, and ourselves. In the computer industry, when talking about the company, on average, 21% of CEOs' first-person pronouns were in the singular. For the extreme takers, 39% of their first-person pronouns were in the singular. Of every 10 words that the taker CEOs uttered referencing themselves, four were about themselves alone and no one else. Another signal was compensation. The taker CEOs earned far more money than other senior executives in their companies. The takers saw themselves as superior, so they felt entitled to substantial pay discrepancies in their own favor. In the computer industry, a typical taker CEO took home more than triple the annual salary and bonus of anyone else in the company. By contrast, the average across the industry was for CEOs to earn just over one and a half times the next highest paid. The taker CEOs also commanded stock options and other non-cash compensation of seven times higher than the next highest paid, compared with the industry average of two and a half times higher. Asterisk. But the most interesting clue was in the annual reports that the companies produced for shareholders each year. At the top of the next page are the pictures of Ken Lay and John Huntsman Sr. that I showed you before, but now they're in context. The photo on the left appeared in Huntsman's 2006 annual report. His image is tiny, taking up less than 10% of the page. The photo on the right appeared in Enron's 1997 annual report. The image of Lay takes up an entire page. When Chatterjee and Hambrick looked at the annual reports from the computer companies, they noticed dramatic differences in the prominence of the CEO's image. In some annual reports, the CEO wasn't pictured at all. In other reports, there was a full-page photo of the CEO alone. Guess which one is the taker? For the taker CEOs, it was all about me. A big photo is self-glorifying, sending a clear message, I am the central figure in this company. But is this really a signal of being a taker? To find out, Chatterjee and Hambrick invited security analysts who specialized in the information technology sector to rate the CEOs. The analysts rated whether each CEO had an inflated sense of self that is reflected in feelings of superiority, entitlement, and a constant need for attention and admiration. Enjoying being the center of attention, insisting upon being shown a great deal of respect, exhibitionism, and arrogance. The analysts' ratings correlated almost perfectly with the size of the CEO's photos. At Enron, in that prescient 1997 report, the spotlight was on Ken Lay. Of the first nine pages, two were dominated by giant full-page images of Lay and then COO Jeff Skilling. The pattern continued in 1998 and 1999, with full-page photos of Lay and Skilling. By 2000, Lay and Skilling had moved up to pages 4 and 5, albeit with smaller images. There were four different photos of each of them, like a film strip, only they were better fit for a cartoon. Three of the photos of Lay were virtually identical, revealing the subtle, smug smile of an executive who knew he was special. A fairy tale ending was not in the cards for Lay, who died of a heart attack before sentencing. So far, we've looked at two different ways to recognize takers. First, when we have access to reputational information, we can see how people have treated others in their networks. 
Second, when we have a chance to observe the actions and imprints of takers, we can look for signs of lacking. Self-glorifying images, self-absorbed conversations, and sizable pay gaps can send accurate, reliable signals that someone is a taker. Thanks to some dramatic changes in the world since 2001, these signals are easier to spot today than ever before. Networks have become more transparent, providing us with new windows through which we can view other people's reputations and lacking. The Transparent Network in 2002, just months after Enron fell apart, a computer scientist by the name of Jonathan Abrams founded Friendster, creating the world's first online social network. Friendster made it possible for people to post their profiles online and broadcast their connections to the world. In the following two years, entrepreneurs launched LinkedIn, MySpace, and Facebook. Strangers now had access to one another's relationships and reputations. By 2012, the world population reached 7 billion. At the same time, Facebook's active users approached a billion, meaning that more than 10% of the people in the world are connected on Facebook. Social networks have always existed, write psychologists Benjamin Crozier, Gregory Webster, and Haley Dillon. It is only recently that the internet has provided a venue for their electronic explosion. From mundane communication to meeting the love of one's life to inciting political revolutions, network ties are the conduits by which information and resources are spread. These online connections have simulated a defining feature of the old world. Before technological revolutions helped us communicate by phone and email, and travel by car and plane, people had relatively manageable numbers of social ties in tightly connected, transparent circles. Within these insulated networks, people could easily gather reputational information and observe lacking. As communication and transportation became easier, and the sheer size of the population grew, interactions became more dispersed and anonymous. Reputations and lacking became less visible. This is why Ken Lay was able to keep much of his taking hidden. As he moved from one position and organization to another, his contacts didn't always have easy access to one another, and the new people who entered his network didn't gain a great deal of information about his reputation. Inside Enron, his impromptu actions couldn't be documented on YouTube, broadcast on Twitter, easily indexed in a Google search, or posted anonymously on internal blogs or the company internet. Now, it's much harder for takers to get away with being fakers, fooling people into thinking they're givers. On the internet, we can now track down reputational information about our contacts by accessing public databases and discovering shared connections. And we no longer need a company's annual report to catch a taker, because lacking in its many sizes and forms abounds in social network profiles. Tiny cues like words and photos can reveal profound clues about us, and research suggests that ordinary people can identify takers just by looking at their Facebook profiles. In one study, psychologists asked people to fill out a survey measuring whether they were takers. Then, the psychologists sent strangers to visit their Facebook pages. The strangers were able to detect the takers with astonishing accuracy. The takers posted information that was rated as more self-promoting, self-absorbed, and self-important. They featured quotes that were evaluated as boastful and arrogant. The takers also had significantly more Facebook friends, racking up superficial connections so they could advertise their accomplishments and stay in touch to get favors, and posted vainer, more flattering pictures of themselves. Howard Lee, the former head of South China at Groupon, is one of a growing number of people who use social media to catch takers. When Lee hired salespeople, many of the strong candidates were aggressive, making it difficult to distinguish the takers from the candidates who are simply gregarious and driven. Lee was enamored with one candidate who had an outstanding resume, aced his interview, and had glowing references. But the candidate could have been faking. Talking to someone for an hour only gives you a glimpse, the tip of the iceberg, Lee thought, and the references were self-selected. A taker could easily find some superiors to sing his praises. So Lee searched through his LinkedIn and Facebook networks and identified a mutual connection, who shared some disconcerting information about the candidate. 
he seemed to be a taker, and it carried a lot of weight. If he's been ruthless in one company, do I want to work with him? Lee feels that online social networks have revolutionized Groupon's hiring process. Nowadays, I don't need to call into a company to find out about someone's reputation. Everyone is incredibly connected. Once they make it past the technical rounds, I check their LinkedIn or Facebook. Sometimes we have mutual friends, or went to the same school, or the people on my team will have a link to them, Lee explains. You can understand someone's reputation at a peer level pretty quickly. When your relationships and reputations are visible to the world, it's harder to achieve sustainable success as a taker. In Silicon Valley, a quiet man who looks like a panda bear is taking transparent networks to the next level. His name is Adam Forrest Rifkin, and he has been called the giant panda of programming. He describes himself as a shy, introverted computer nerd who has two favorite languages, JavaScript, the computer programming language, and Klingon, the language spoken by the aliens on Star Trek. Asterisk Rifkin is an anagramaniac, he has spent countless hours rearranging the letters in his name to find the one that captures him best, generating candidates such as Offer Radiant Smirk and Feminist Radar Fork. Rifkin has two master's degrees in computer science, owns a patent, and has developed supercomputer applications for NASA and Internet systems for Microsoft. As the new millennium approached, Rifkin co-founded NowNow, a software startup with Rohit Kari, helping companies manage information more efficiently and profitably. NowNow achieved a decade of success after bringing in more than $50 million in venture funding. By 2009, while still in his 30s, Rifkin announced his retirement. I came across Rifkin while scrolling through the LinkedIn connections of David Hornick, the venture capitalist whom you met in the previous chapter. When I clicked on Rifkin's profile, I saw that he was coming out of retirement to launch a startup called Pandawale, with the goal of creating a public, permanent record of the information that people exchange. Since Rifkin is clearly a staunch advocate of transparency in networks, I was curious to see what his own network looks like. So I did what's only natural in a connected world. I went to Google and typed, Adam Rifkin. As I scrolled through the search results, the 16th link caught my eye. It said that Adam Rifkin was Fortune's best networker. What goes around comes around. In 2011, Adam Rifkin had more LinkedIn connections to the 640 powerful people on Fortune's lists than any human being on the planet. He beat out luminaries like Michael Dell, the billionaire founder of the Dell Computer Company, and Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn. Asterisk I was stunned that a shy, Star Trek-loving, anagram-obsessing software geek managed to build a network that includes the founders of Facebook, Netscape, Napster, Twitter, Flickr, and Half.com. Adam Rifkin built his network by operating as a bona fide giver. My network developed little by little, in fact a little every day through small gestures and acts of kindness, over the course of many years, Rifkin explains, with a desire to make better the lives of the people I'm connected to. Since 1994, Rifkin has served as a leader and watchdog in a wide range of online communities, working diligently to strengthen relationships and help people resolve online conflicts. As the co-founder of Rinku, a startup with Joyce Park, Rifkin created applications that were used more than 500 million times by more than 36 million people on Facebook and MySpace. Despite their popularity, Rifkin wasn't satisfied. If you're going to get tens of millions of people using your software, you really should do something meaningful, something that changes the world, he says. Frankly, I would like to see more people helping other people. He decided to shut down Rinku and become a full-time giver, offering extensive guidance to startups and working to connect engineers and entrepreneurs with business people in larger companies. To this end, in 2005, Rifkin and Joyce Park founded 106 Miles, a professional network with the social mission of educating entrepreneurial engineers through dialogue. This network has brought together more than 5,000 entrepreneurs who meet twice every month to help one another learn and succeed. 
I get roped into giving free advice to other entrepreneurs, which is usually worth less than they pay for it, he muses, but, helping others is my favorite thing to do. This approach has led to great things, not just for Rifkin, but also for those he's shepherded along the way. In 2001, Rifkin was a big fan of Blogger, an early blog publishing service. Blogger had run out of funding, so Rifkin offered a contract to Blogger's founder to do some work for his own first startup, Now Now. We decided to hire him because we wanted to see Blogger survive, Rifkin says. We gave him a contract to build something for our company so we could use it as a demo and he could keep Blogger going. The money from the contract helped the founder keep Blogger afloat, and he went on to co-found a company called Twitter. There were several other people who also contracted with Evan Williams so he could keep his company going, Rifkin reflects. You never know where somebody's going to end up. It's not just about building your reputation, it really is about being there for other people. In the search for Fortune's best networker, when Rifkin popped up as the winner, the reporter on the story, Jessica Shambora, laughed out loud. Not surprisingly, I had already met him. Someone had referred me to him for a story I was researching on virtual goods and social networks. Shambora, who now works at Facebook, says that Rifkin is the consummate networker, and he didn't get that way by being some sort of climber, or calculated. People go to Adam because they know his heart is in the right place. When he first moved up to Silicon Valley, Rifkin felt that giving was a natural way to come out of his shell. As a very shy, sheltered computer guy, the concept of the network was my North Star, he says. When you have nothing, what's the first thing you try to do? You try to make a connection and have a relationship that gives you an opportunity to do something for someone else. On Rifkin's LinkedIn page, his motto is, I want to improve the world, and I want to smell good while doing it. As of September 2012, on LinkedIn, 49 people have written recommendations for Rifkin, and no attribute is mentioned more frequently than his giving. A matcher would write recommendations back for the same 49 people, and perhaps sprinkle in a few unsolicited recommendations for key contacts, in the hopes that they'll reciprocate. But Rifkin gives more than five times as much as he gets. On LinkedIn, he has written detailed recommendations for 265 different people. Adam is off the charts in how much he helps, says the entrepreneur Raymond Roof. He gives a lot more than he receives. It's part of his mantra to be helpful. Rifkin's networking style, which exemplifies how givers tend to approach networks, stands in stark contrast to the way that takers and matchers tend to build and extract value from their connections. The fact that Rifkin gives a lot more than he receives is a key point. Takers and matchers also give in the context of networks, but they tend to give strategically, with an expected personal return that exceeds or equals their contributions. When takers and matchers network, they tend to focus on who can help them in the near future, and this dictates what, where, and how they give. Their actions tend to exploit a common practice in nearly all societies around the world, in which people typically subscribe to a norm of reciprocity, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If you help me, I'm indebted to you, and I feel obligated to repay. According to the psychologist Robert Cialdini, people can capitalize on this norm of reciprocity by giving what they want to receive. Instead of just reactively doing favors for the people who have already helped them, takers and matchers often proactively offer favors to people whose help they want in the future. Asterisk as networking guru Keith Ferrazzi summarizes in Never Eat Alone, it's better to give before you receive. Ken Lay lived by this principle. He had a knack for doing unrequested favors so that important people would feel compelled to respond in kind. When he was kissing up, he went out of his way to rack up credits with powerful people who he could call in later. In 1994, George W. Bush was running for governor of Texas. Bush was an underdog, but just in case, Lay made a donation of $12,500, as did his wife. Once Bush was elected governor, Lay supported one of Bush's literacy initiatives and ended up writing him two dozen lobbying letters. 
According to one citizen watchdog leader, Lay commanded, quid pro quo, helping Bush so that Bush would support utility deregulation. In one letter, Lay subtly hinted at his willingness to continue reciprocating if Bush helped to advance his goals, let me know what Enron can do to be helpful in not only passing electricity restructuring legislation but also in pursuing the rest of your legislative agenda. Reciprocity is a powerful norm, but it comes with two downsides, both of which contribute to the cautiousness with which many of us approach networking. The first downside is that people on the receiving end often feel like they're being manipulated. Dan Weinstein, a former Olympic speed skater and current marketing consultant at Resource Systems Group, notes that, some of the bigger management consulting firms own box seats at major sporting events. When these firms offer Red Sox tickets to their clients, the clients know that they're doing so, at least in part, with the hopes of getting something in return. When favors come with strings attached or implied, the interaction can leave a bad taste, feeling more like a transaction than part of a meaningful relationship. Do you really care about helping me, or are you just trying to create quid pro quo so that you can ask for a favor? Apparently, Ken Lay made such an impression on George W. Bush. When Bush was running for governor, he asked Lay to chair one of his finance campaigns. At the time, Lay didn't think Bush had a chance, so he declined, stating that he was already serving on a business council for the Democratic incumbent, Ann Richards. As a consolation prize, he made his $12,500 donation. Then, toward the end of the campaign, when it looked like Bush had a good chance of winning, Lay quickly made another donation of $12,500. Even though Lay ended up donating more money to Bush than to Richards, his decision to give only when it was strategic left an indelible dent in the relationship. This decision, relegated him forever to the periphery of George W. Bush's inner circle, wrote one journalist, citing a dozen insiders who confided that Lay created, a distance between them that was never really bridged. Bush never invited Lay to stay in the White House, as his father had. When the Enron scandal broke, Lay reached out to a number of political officials for help, but Bush wasn't one of them, the relationship wasn't strong enough. There's a second downside of reciprocity, and it's one to which matchers are especially vulnerable. Matchers tend to build smaller networks than either givers, who seek actively to help a wider range of people, or takers, who often find themselves expanding their networks to compensate for bridges burned in previous transactions. Many matchers operate based on the attitude of, I'll do something for you, if you'll do something for me, writes LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman, so they, limit themselves to deals in which their immediate benefit is at least as great as the benefits for others. If you insist on a quid pro quo every time you help others, you will have a much narrower network. When matchers give with the expectation of receiving, they direct their giving toward people who they think can help them. After all, if you don't benefit from having your favors reciprocated, what's the value of being a matcher? As these disadvantages of strict reciprocity accrue over time, they can limit both the quantity and quality of the networks that takers and matchers develop. Both disadvantages ultimately arise out of a short-sightedness about networks, in that takers and matchers make hard and fast assumptions about just who will be able to provide the most benefit in exchange. At its core, the giver approach extends a broader reach, and in doing so enlarges the range of potential payoffs, even though those payoffs are not the motivating engine. When you meet people, says former Apple evangelist and Silicon Valley legend Guy Kawasaki, regardless of who they are, you should be asking yourself, how can I help the other person? This may strike some as a way to overinvest in others, but as Adam Rifkin once learned to great effect, we can't always predict who can help us. Waking the Sleeping Giants In 1993, a college student named Graham Spencer teamed up with five friends to build an internet startup. Spencer was a shy, introverted computer engineer with a receding hairline, huge glasses, and an obsession with comic books. Looking back, he says Superman taught him justice and virtue, the X-Men kindled concern for oppressed groups, and Spider-Man gave him hope, 
even superheroes could have a rough time in school. Spencer and his friends co-founded Excite, an early web portal and search engine that quickly became one of the most popular sites on the internet. In 1998, Excite was purchased for $6.7 billion, and Spencer was flying high as its largest shareholder and chief technology officer. In 1999, shortly after selling Excite, Spencer received an email out of the blue from Adam Rifkin, who was asking for advice on a startup. They had never met, but Spencer volunteered to sit down with Rifkin anyway. After they met, Spencer connected Rifkin with a venture capitalist who ended up funding his startup. How did Rifkin get access to Spencer? And why did Spencer go out of his way to help Rifkin? Early in 1994, five years before seeking Spencer's help, Rifkin became enamored with an emerging band. He wanted to help the band gain popularity, so he put his computer prowess into action and created a fan website, hosted on the Caltech server. It was an authentic expression of being a fan of music. I love the music. The page took off. Hundreds of thousands of people found it as the band skyrocketed from anonymity into stardom. The band was called Green Day. Rifkin's fan site was so popular in the burgeoning days of the commercial internet that in 1995, Green Day's managers contacted him to ask if they could take it over and make it the band's official page. I said, great, it's all yours, Rifkin recalls. I just gave it to them. The previous summer, in 1994, millions of people had visited Rifkin's site. One of the visitors, a serious punk rock fan, felt that Green Day was really pop music. He had emailed Rifkin to educate him about, real, punk rock. The fan was none other than Graham Spencer. Spencer suggested that when people searched for punk rock on the internet, they should find more than Green Day. When Rifkin read the email, he imagined Spencer as a stereotypical punk rock fan with a green mohawk. Rifkin had no idea that Spencer would ever be able to help him, it would only come out much later that Spencer had just started Excite. A taker or matcher might have ignored the email from Spencer. But as a giver, Rifkin's natural inclination was to help Spencer spread the word about punk rock and help struggling bands build up a fan base. So Rifkin set up a separate page on the Green Day fan site with links to the punk rock bands that Spencer suggested. There's an elegance to Adam Rifkin's experience with Graham Spencer, a satisfying sense of good deeds rewarded. But if we take a closer look, we find an example of just what makes Giver Networks so powerful, and it has as much to do with the five years that passed after Rifkin's generosity as with the generosity itself. Rifkin's experiences foreshadow how givers have the advantage of accessing the full breadth of their networks. One of Rifkin's maxims is, I believe in the strength of weak ties. It's an homage to a classic study by the Stanford sociologist Mark Granovetter. Strong ties are our close friends and colleagues, the people we really trust. Weak ties are our acquaintances, the people we know casually. Testing the common assumption that we get the most help from our strong ties, Granovetter surveyed people in professional, technical, and managerial professions who had recently changed jobs. Nearly 17% heard about the job from a strong tie. Their friends and trusted colleagues gave them plenty of leads. But surprisingly, people were significantly more likely to benefit from weak ties. Almost 28% heard about the job from a weak tie. Strong ties provide bonds, but weak ties serve as bridges, they provide more efficient access to new information. Our strong ties tend to travel in the same social circles and know about the same opportunities as we do. Weak ties are more likely to open up access to a different network, facilitating the discovery of original leads. Here's the wrinkle, it's tough to ask weak ties for help. Although they're the faster route to new leads, we don't always feel comfortable reaching out to them. The lack of mutual trust between acquaintances creates a psychological barrier. But givers like Adam Rifkin have discovered a loophole. It's possible to get the best of both worlds, the trust of strong ties coupled with the novel information of weak ties. The key is reconnecting, and it's a major reason why givers succeed in the long run.
After Rifkin created the punk rock links on the Green Day site for Spencer in 1994, Excite took off, and Rifkin went back to graduate school. They lost touch for five years. When Rifkin was moving to Silicon Valley, he dug up the old email chain and drafted a note to Spencer. You may not remember me from five years ago, I'm the guy who made the change to the Green Day website, Rifkin wrote. I'm starting a company and moving to Silicon Valley, and I don't know a lot of people. Would you be willing to meet with me and offer advice? Rifkin wasn't being a matcher. When he originally helped Spencer, he did it with no strings attached, never intending to call in a favor. But five years later, when he needed help, he reached out with a genuine request. Spencer was glad to help, and they met up for coffee. I still pictured him as this huge guy with a mohawk, Rifkin says. When I met him in person, he hardly said any words at all. He was even more introverted than I am. By the second meeting, Spencer was introducing Rifkin to a venture capitalist. A completely random set of events that happened in 1994 led to reengaging with him over email in 1999, which led to my company getting founded in 2000, Rifkin recalls. Givers get lucky. Yet there's reason to believe that part of what Rifkin calls luck is in fact a predictable, patterned response that most people have to givers. Thirty years ago, the sociologist Fred Goldner wrote about what it means to experience the opposite of paranoia, pronoia. According to the distinguished psychologist Brian Little, pronoia is, the delusional belief that other people are plotting your well-being, or saying nice things about you behind your back. If you're a giver, this belief may be a reality, not a delusion. What if other people are actually plotting the success of givers like Adam Rifkin? In 2005, when Rifkin was starting Rinku with Joyce Park, they didn't have any office space, so they were working out of Rifkin's kitchen. A colleague went out of his way to introduce Rifkin to Reid Hoffman, who had recently founded LinkedIn, which had fewer than 50 employees at the time. Hoffman met up with Rifkin and Park on a Sunday and offered them free desks at LinkedIn, putting Rifkin in the heart of Silicon Valley. In the summer of 2005, one of the companies right next to us was YouTube, and we got to meet them in their infancy before they really took off, Rifkin says. Rifkin's experience sheds new light on the old saying that what goes around comes around. These karmic moments can often be traced to the fact that matchers are on a mission to make them happen. Just as matchers will sacrifice their own interests to punish takers who act selfishly toward others, they'll go out of their way to reward givers who act generously toward others. When Adam Rifkin helped people in his network, the matchers felt it was only fair to plot his well-being. True to form, he used his newfound access at LinkedIn to plot the well-being of other people in his network, referring engineers for jobs at LinkedIn. On a Wednesday evening in May, I got to see the panda in his natural habitat. At a bar for a 106 miles meeting in Redwood City, Rifkin walked in with a huge grin, wearing a San Francisco Giants jersey. He was immediately swarmed by a group of tech entrepreneurs, some smooth, others endearingly awkward. As dozens of entrepreneurs piled into the bar, Rifkin was able to tell me each of their stories, which was no small feat for someone who receives more than 800 emails in a typical day. His secret was deceptively simple. He asked thoughtful questions and listened with remarkable patience. Early in the evening, Rifkin asked one budding entrepreneur how his company was doing. The entrepreneur talked for 14 minutes without interruption. Although the monologue might have exhausted even the most curious of tech geeks, Rifkin never lost interest. Where do you need help? He asked, and the entrepreneur mentioned a need for a programmer specializing in an obscure computer language. Rifkin started scrolling through his mental Rolodex and recommended candidates to contact. Later in the evening, one of those candidates arrived in person, and Rifkin made the introduction. As the crowd grew, Rifkin still took the time to have a personal conversation with everyone there. When new members approached him, he typically spent 15 or 20 minutes getting to know them, asking what motivated them and how he could help them. 
Many of those people were complete strangers, but just as he had helped Graham Spencer 18 years earlier without thinking twice, he took it upon himself to find them jobs, connect them to potential co-founders, and offer advice for solving problems in their companies. Each time he gave, he created a new connection. But is it really possible to keep up with all of these contacts? Dormant Ties Because he maintains such a large network, Adam Rifkin has a growing number of dormant ties, people he used to see often or know well, but with whom he has since fallen out of contact. According to management professors Daniel Levin, Jorge Walter, and Keith Mernigan, adults accumulate thousands of relationships over their lifetimes, but, prior to the internet, they actively maintained no more than 100 or 200 at any given time. For the past few years, these professors have been asking executives to do something that they dread, reactivate their dormant ties. When one executive learned of the assignment, I groaned. If there are dormant contacts, they are dormant for a reason, right? Why would I want to contact them? But the evidence tells a different story. In one study, Levin and colleagues asked more than 200 executives to reactivate ties that had been dormant for a minimum of three years. Each executive reached out to two former colleagues and sought advice on an ongoing work project. After receiving the advice, they rated its value, to what extent did it help them solve problems and gain useful referrals. They also rated the advice that they received from two current contacts on the same project. Surprisingly, the executives rated the advice from the dormant ties as contributing more value than the advice from the current ties. Why? The dormant ties provided more novel information than the current contacts. Over the past few years, while they were out of touch, they had been exposed to new ideas and perspectives. The current contacts were more likely to share the knowledge base and viewpoint that the executives already possessed. One executive commented that, before contacting them I thought that they would not have too much to provide beyond what I had already thought, but I was proved wrong. I was very surprised by the fresh ideas. Dormant ties offer the access to novel information that weak ties afford, but without the discomfort. As Levin and colleagues explain, reconnecting a dormant relationship is not like starting a relationship from scratch. When people reconnect, they still have feelings of trust. An executive divulged that, I feel comfortable. I didn't need to guess what his intentions were. There was mutual trust that we built years ago that made our conversation today smoother. Reactivating a dormant tie actually required a shorter conversation, since there was already some common ground. The executives didn't need to invest in building a relationship from the start with their dormant ties, as they would with weak ties. Levin and colleagues asked another group of more than 100 executives to identify 10 dormant ties and rank them in order of the likely value they would provide. The executives then reactivated all 10 dormant ties and rated the value of the conversations. All 10 dormant ties provided high value, and there were no differences by rank. The executives got just as much value from their 10th choice as from their first choice. When we need new information, we may run out of weak ties quickly, but we have a large pool of dormant ties that prove to be helpful. And the older we get, the more dormant ties we have, and the more valuable they become. Levin and colleagues found that people in their 40s and 50s received more value from reactivating dormant ties than people in their 30s, who in turn benefited more than people in their 20s. The executive who groaned about reconnecting admitted that it, has been eye-opening for me. It has shown me how much potential I have in my Rolodex. Dormant ties are the neglected value in our networks, and givers have a distinctive edge over takers and matchers in unlocking this value. For takers, reactivating dormant ties is a challenge. If the dormant ties are fellow takers, they'll be suspicious and self-protective, withholding novel information. If the dormant ties are matchers, they may be motivated to punish takers, as we saw in the ultimatum game. If the dormant ties are smart givers, as you'll see later in this book, they won't be so willing to help takers. And of course, if a taker's self-serving actions were what caused a tie to become dormant in the first place, it may be impossible to revive the relationship at all.
Matchers have a much easier time reconnecting, but they're often uncomfortable reaching out for help because of their fidelity to the norm of reciprocity. When they ask for a favor, they feel that they'll owe one back. If they're already indebted to the dormant tie and haven't yet evened the score, it's doubly difficult to ask. And for many matchers, dormant ties haven't built up a deep reservoir of trust, since they've been more like transactional exchanges than meaningful relationships. According to networking experts, reconnecting is a totally different experience for givers, especially in a wired world. Givers have a track record of generously sharing their knowledge, teaching us their skills, and helping us find jobs without worrying about what's in it for them, so we're glad to help them when they get back in touch with us. Today, Adam Rifkin spends less time networking with new people than he did earlier in his career, focusing instead on a growing number of dormant ties. Now my time is spent going back to people who I haven't talked to in a while. When he reactivates one of his many dormant ties, the contact is usually thrilled to hear from him. His generosity and kindness have earned their trust. They're grateful for his help, and they know it didn't come with strings attached. He's always willing to share his knowledge, offer advice, or make an introduction. In 2006, Rifkin was looking for a dynamite speaker for a 106 miles meeting. He reconnected with Evan Williams, and although Williams had become famous and was extremely busy with the launch of Twitter, he agreed. Five years later, when we asked him to speak to the group, he never forgot, Rifkin says. The type of goodwill that givers like Rifkin build is the subject of fascinating research. Traditionally, social network researchers map information exchange, the flows of knowledge from person to person. But when Wayne Baker collaborated with University of Virginia professor Rob Cross and IBM's Andrew Parker, he realized that it was also possible to track the flows of energy through networks. In a range of organizations, employees rated their interactions with one another on a scale from strongly de-energizing to strongly energizing. The researchers created an energy network map, which looked like a model of a galaxy. The takers were black holes. They sucked the energy from those around them. The givers were suns, they injected light around the organization. Givers created opportunities for their colleagues to contribute, rather than imposing their ideas and hogging credit for achievements. When they disagreed with suggestions, givers showed respect for the people who spoke up, rather than belittling them. If you mapped energy in Adam Rifkin's network, you'd find that he looks like the sun in many different solar systems. Several years ago at a holiday party, Rifkin met a struggling entrepreneur named Raymond Roof. They started chatting, and Rifkin gave him some feedback. Six months later, Roof was working on a new startup and reached out to Rifkin for advice. Rifkin replied the same day and set up a breakfast for the next morning, where he spent two hours giving more feedback to Roof. A few months later, they crossed paths again. Roof had gone two years without an income, and the plumbing in his house wasn't working, so he bought a gym membership just to shower there. He ran into Rifkin, who asked how the startup was going and offered some invaluable insights about how to reposition his company. Rifkin then proceeded to introduce Roof to a venture capitalist, who ended up funding his company and becoming a board member. The two of them would have meetings about me, to discuss how they could help me, Roof says. Roof's company, Graph Science, has become one of the top Facebook analytics companies in the world, and he says it never would have happened without Rifkin's help. Rifkin has even managed to light up projects for a Hollywood writer-director. As you'll see in Chapter 8, they met because Rifkin shared his contact information openly on the internet. In a casual conversation, the Hollywood director mentioned that he had just finished production on a Showtime series and asked Rifkin for help. Although he is quite successful in his chosen field, I didn't put too much credence in his skill as a Hollywood publicist, says the director. Boy was I wrong. Within 24 hours, Rifkin set up meetings and private screenings of the show with top-ranking executives at Twitter and YouTube. The Hollywood contact explains. It's important to emphasize, Adam had absolutely no stake in my show's success. Sink or swim, he wouldn't benefit or suffer either way. 
But true to his genuine joy of giving, he went out of his way to introduce us to countless media opportunities. When the dust had settled, he was single-handedly responsible for positive and glowing articles in countless national media outlets as well as incredible social media publicity. In the end, his generosity was more far-reaching and far more effective than our show's highly paid Hollywood publicist. As a result, the show enjoyed the highest ratings ever received in its time slot in Showtime's history. Showtime, so impressed with our modest show's numbers, has already given the green light to another series. His generosity is responsible for the show being a hit and Showtime saying yes to my current series. For someone who gives off these vibes and inspires such goodwill, reconnecting is an energizing experience. Think back to the 265 people for whom Rifkin has written LinkedIn recommendations, or the hundreds of entrepreneurs he helps in 106 miles. It's not a stretch to imagine that every one of them will be enthusiastic about reconnecting with Rifkin, and helping him out, if they happen to lose touch. But Adam Rifkin isn't after their help, at least not for himself. Rifkin's real aim is to change our fundamental ideas about how we build our networks and who should benefit from them. He believes that we should see networks as a vehicle for creating value for everyone, not just claiming it for ourselves. And he is convinced that this giver approach to networking can uproot the traditional norm of reciprocity in a manner that's highly productive for all involved. The 5-Minute Favor in 2012, a LinkedIn recruiter named Stephanie was asked to list the three people who had the most influence on her career. Adam Rifkin was shocked to learn that he appeared on her list, because they had met only once, months earlier. Stephanie was searching for a job and met Rifkin through a friend of a friend. He gave her advice, primarily by text message, and helped her find job leads. She emailed him to express her gratitude and offered to reciprocate. I know we only met in person once and we talk only occasionally, but you have helped me more than you know. I really would like to do something to help give back to you. But Stephanie wasn't just looking to help Adam Rifkin. Instead, she volunteered to attend a 106 miles meeting of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs so she could help Rifkin help them. At the meeting, Stephanie would give entrepreneurs feedback on their ideas, offer to test their product prototypes, and facilitate connections with potential collaborators and investors. The same thing has happened with many other people whom Rifkin helps. Raymond Roof often drops by 106 miles meetings to assist other entrepreneurs. So does an engineer named Bob, who met Rifkin in a bar in 2009. They struck up a conversation, and Rifkin learned that Bob was out of work, so he made some introductions that landed Bob a position. The company went out of business, and Rifkin made more connections that resulted in a job for Bob at a startup, which was acquired six months later by Google. Today, Bob is a successful Google engineer, and he's paying the help he received forward across the 106 miles network. This is a new spin on reciprocity. In traditional old-school reciprocity, people operated like matchers, trading value back and forth with one another. We helped the people who helped us, and we gave to the people from whom we wanted something in return. But today, givers like Adam Rifkin are able to spark a more powerful form of reciprocity. Instead of trading value, Rifkin aims to add value. His giving is governed by a simple rule, the five-minute favor. You should be willing to do something that will take you five minutes or less for anybody. Rifkin doesn't think about what any of the people he helps will contribute back to him. Whereas takers accumulate large networks to look important and gain access to powerful people, and matchers do it to get favors, Rifkin does it to create more opportunities for giving. In the words of Harvard political scientist Robert Putnam, I'll do this for you without expecting anything specific back from you, in the confident expectation that someone else will do something for me down the road. When people feel grateful for Rifkin's help, like Stephanie, they're more likely to pay it forward. I have always been a very genuine and kind-hearted person, Stephanie says, but I had tried to hide it and be more competitive so that I could get ahead. 
The important lesson I learned from Adam is that you can be a genuinely kind-hearted person and still get ahead in the world. Every time Rifkin generously shares his expertise or connections, he's investing in encouraging the people in his network to act like givers. When Rifkin does ask people for help, he's usually asking for assistance in helping someone else. This increases the odds that the people in his vast network will seek to add value rather than trade value, opening the door for him and others to gain benefits from people they've never helped, or even met. By creating a norm of adding value, Rifkin transforms giving from a zero-sum loss to a win-win gain. When takers build networks, they try to claim as much value as possible for themselves from a fixed pie. When givers like Rifkin build networks, they expand the pie so that everyone can get a larger slice. Nick Sullivan, an entrepreneur who has benefited from Rifkin's help, says that, Adam has the same effect on all of us, getting us to help people. Roof elaborates, Adam always wants to make sure that whoever he's giving to is also giving to somebody else. If people benefit from his advice, he makes sure they help other people he gives advice to, it's creating a network, and making sure that everybody in his network is helping each other, paying it forward. Cutting-edge research shows how Rifkin motivates other people to give. Giving, especially when it's distinctive and consistent, establishes a pattern that shifts other people's reciprocity styles within a group. It turns out that giving can be contagious. In one study, contagion experts James Fowler and Nicholas Christakis found that giving spreads rapidly and widely across social networks. When one person made the choice to contribute to a group at a personal cost over a series of rounds, other group members were more likely to contribute in future rounds, even when interacting with people who weren't present for the original act. This influence persists for multiple periods and spreads up to three degrees of separation, from person to person to person to person Fowler and Christakis find, such that, each additional contribution a subject makes in the first period is tripled over the course of the experiment by other subjects who are directly or indirectly influenced to contribute more as a consequence. When people walk into a new situation, they look to others for clues about appropriate behavior. When giving starts to occur, it becomes the norm, and people carry it forward in interactions with other people. To illustrate, imagine that you're assigned to a group of four. The other three people are strangers, and you'll each make anonymous decisions, with no opportunity to communicate, during six rounds. In each round, each of you will receive three dollars and decide whether to take it for yourselves or give it to the group. If you take it, you get the full three dollars. If you give it to the group, every group member gets two dollars, including you. At the end of each round, you'll find out what everyone decided. The group is better off if everyone gives, each member would end up receiving $8 per round, for a maximum total over 6 rounds of $48. But if you give and no one else does, you only get $12. This creates an incentive to take, which will guarantee you $18. Since you can't communicate with one another, giving is a risky strategy. But in the actual study, 15% of the participants were consistent givers, they contributed to the group in all six rounds, making a personal sacrifice for the benefit of the group. And it wasn't as costly as you'd expect. Surprisingly, the consistent givers still ended up doing well, they walked away with an average of 26% more money than participants from groups without a single consistent giver. How could they give more and get more? When the groups included one consistent giver, the other members contributed more. The presence of a single giver was enough to establish a norm of giving. By giving, participants were able to make their group members better off and managed to get more in the process. Even though they earned 50% less from each contribution, because they inspired others to give, they made a larger total sum available to all participants. The givers raised the bar and expanded the pie for the whole group. In this experiment, the consistent givers were doing the equivalent of a five-minute favor when they contributed their money every round. They were making small sacrifices to benefit each member of the group, and it inspired the group members to do the same. 
Through the five-minute favor, Rifkin is expanding the pie for his whole network. In 106 miles, the norm is for all 5,000 entrepreneurs to help one another. Rifkin explains that, you're not doing somebody a favor because you're getting something in return. The goal of the group is to instill the value of giving. You don't have to be transactional about it, you don't have to trade it. If you do something for somebody in the group, then when you need it, someone in the group will do something for you. For takers and matchers, this type of relentless giving still seems a bit risky. Can givers like Adam Rifkin maintain their productivity, especially when there are no guarantees that their help will come back around to benefit them directly? To shed light on this question, Stanford professor Frank Flynn studied professional engineers at a large telecommunications firm in the Bay Area. He asked the engineers to rate themselves and one another on how much they gave and received help from one another, which allowed him to identify which engineers were givers, takers, and matchers. He also asked each engineer to rate the status of 10 other engineers, how much respect did they have. The takers had the lowest status. They burned bridges by constantly asking for favors but rarely reciprocating. Their colleagues saw them as selfish and punished them with a lack of respect. The givers had the highest status, outdoing the matchers and takers. The more generous they were, the more respect and prestige they earned from their colleagues. Through giving more than they got, givers signaled their unique skills, demonstrated their value, and displayed their good intentions. Despite being held in the highest esteem, the givers faced a problem, they paid a productivity price. For three months, Flynn measured the quantity and quality of work completed by each engineer. The givers were more productive than the takers, they worked harder and got more done. But the matchers had the highest productivity, beating out the givers. The time that the givers devoted to helping their colleagues apparently detracted from their ability to finish jobs, reports, and drawings. The matchers were more likely to call in favors and receive help, and it appeared to keep them on track. On the face of it, this seems like a stumbling block to the giver style of networking. If givers sacrifice their productivity by helping others, how can it be worth it? Yet Adam Rifkin has managed to be a giver and stay highly productive as the co-founder of several successful companies. How does he avoid the trade-off between giving and productivity? He gives more. In the study of engineers, the givers didn't always pay a productivity price. Flynn measured whether the engineers were givers, matchers, or takers by asking their colleagues to rate whether they gave more, the same, or less than they received. This meant that some engineers could score as givers even if they didn't help others very often, as long as they asked for less in return. When Flynn examined the data based on how often the engineers gave and received help, the givers only took a productivity dive when they gave infrequently. Of all engineers, the most productive were those who gave often, and gave more than they received. These were the true givers, and they had the highest productivity and the highest status, they were revered by their peers. By giving often, engineers built up more trust and attracted more valuable help from across their work groups, not just from the people they helped. This is exactly what has happened to Adam Rifkin with his five-minute favors. In the days before social media, Rifkin might have toiled in anonymity. Thanks to the connected world, his reputation as a giver has traveled faster than the speed of sound. It takes him no time to raise funding for his startups, Roof says with a trace of astonishment. He has such a great reputation, people know he's a good guy. That's a dividend that gets paid because of who he is. Rifkin's experience illustrates how givers are able to develop and leverage extraordinarily rich networks. By virtue of the way they interact with other people in their networks, givers create norms that favor adding rather than claiming or trading value, expanding the pie for all involved. When they truly need help, givers can reconnect with dormant ties, receiving novel assistance from near-forgotten but trusted sources. I'll sum up the key to success in one word, generosity, writes Keith Ferrazzi. If your interactions are ruled by generosity, your rewards will follow suit. 
Perhaps it's not a coincidence that Ivan Misner, the founder and chairman of BNI, the world's largest business networking organization, needs just two words to describe his guiding philosophy, giver's gain. After years of rearranging the letters in his name, Adam Rifkin has settled on the perfect anagram, I find karma. 3. The ripple effect. Collaboration and the dynamics of giving and taking credit. It is well to remember that the entire universe, with one trifling exception, is composed of others. John Andrew Holmes, former U.S. representative and senator. You probably don't recognize George Meyer's name, but you're definitely familiar with his work. In fact, odds are that someone close to you is a big fan of his ideas, which have captivated an entire generation of people around the world. Although I didn't know it belonged to him until recently, I've admired his work since I was nine years old. Meyer is a tall, angular man in his mid-fifties who sports long, stringy hair and a goatee. If you ran into him on the street, you wouldn't be able to place his face, but you might have a hunch that he's a Grateful Dead fan. You'd be right. In the last five years of Jerry Garcia's life, Meyer attended at least 70 different Grateful Dead concerts. Meyer attended college at Harvard, where he was nearly suspended after he sold a refrigerator to a freshman and accepted payment, but never delivered it. He was almost suspended again when he used an electric guitar to shatter a window of a dorm room. A rare bright spot in his college career was being elected president of the Harvard Lampoon, the famous comedy magazine, but it was quickly tarnished by an attempted coup. According to journalist David Owen, Meyer's peers tried to overthrow him in a bitter and vituperative internal battle because they thought he wasn't responsible enough. After graduating from college in 1978, Meyer moved back home and looked for ways to earn quick cash. He spent much of his time in college gambling on dog races at a Greyhound track, so he thought he might be able to make a career out of it. He parked himself at a public library and began analyzing scientific strategies for beating the system. It didn't work. After two weeks, he ran out of money. Three decades later, George Meyer is one of the most successful people in show business. He has been a major contributor to a movie that grossed more than $527 million. He has won seven Emmy Awards and invented several words that have entered English dictionaries, one of which was uttered every day by my college roommate for four years. But he is most celebrated for his role in a television phenomenon that has changed the world. Insiders maintain that as much as any other person, he is responsible for the success of the show that Time magazine named the single best television series of the 20th century. In 1981, at the recommendation of two friends, Meyer sent a few writing samples to a new NBC show called Late Night with David Letterman. Everything in his submission, down to the last little detail, was so beautifully honed, Letterman gushed to Owen. I haven't run across anybody quite like that since. During the first season, Meyer invented what was to become one of Letterman's signature routines, using a steamroller to crush ordinary objects, like pieces of fruit. After two years with Letterman, Meyer left to work on the new show with Lorne Michaels and then joined Saturday Night Live, departing in 1987 to write a script for a Letterman movie that was ultimately shelved. When Meyer's two friends recommended him to Letterman, they called him, the funniest man in America. This wasn't a statement to be taken lightly, the two went on to become an Emmy-winning pair of comedy writers on shows like Seinfeld, The Wonder Years, and Monk. And if you look at what George Meyer has accomplished since he finished the Letterman movie script, you might be inclined to agree with them. George Meyer is the mastermind of much of the humor on The Simpsons, the longest-running sitcom and animated program in America. The Simpsons has won 27 Primetime Emmy Awards, six of which went to Meyer, and changed the face of animated comedy. Although Meyer didn't launch The Simpsons, it was created by Matt Groening and developed with James L. Brooks and Sam Simon, there is widespread consensus that Meyer was the most important force behind the show's success. 
Meyer was hired to write for The Simpsons before it premiered in 1989, and he was a major contributor for 16 seasons as a writer and executive producer. Meyer has so thoroughly shaped the program that by now the comedic sensibility of The Simpsons could be viewed as mostly his, writes Owen. According to humor writer Mike Sachs, Meyer is largely considered among the writing staff to be its behind-the-scenes genius among geniuses, the man, responsible for the best lines and jokes. John Biddy, one of the original Simpsons writers who authored many of the early episodes and later served as a producer on The Office, elaborated that Meyer is, the one in the room who writes more of the show than anyone else, his fingerprints are on nearly every script. He exerts as much influence on the show as anyone can without being one of the creators. How does a man like George Meyer become so successful in collaborative work? Reciprocity styles offer a powerful lens for explaining why some people flourish in teams while others fail. In Multipliers, former Oracle executive Liz Wiseman distinguishes between geniuses and genius makers. Geniuses tend to be takers. To promote their own interests, they drain intelligence, energy, and capability from others. Genius makers tend to be givers. They use their intelligence to amplify the smarts and capabilities of other people, Wiseman writes, such that light bulbs go off over people's heads, ideas flow, and problems get solved. My goal in this chapter is to explore how these differences between givers and takers affect individual and group success. Collaboration and creative character. When we consider what it takes to attain George Meyer's level of comedic impact, there's little question that creativity is a big part of the equation. Carolyn Omini, a longtime Simpsons writer and producer, says that Meyer has a distinct way of looking at the world. It's completely unique. Executive producer and showrunner Mike Scully once commented that when he first joined The Simpsons, Meyer just blew me away. I had done a lot of sitcom work before, but George's stuff was so different and so original that for a while I wondered if I wasn't in over my head. To unlock the mystery of how people become highly creative, back in 1958, a Berkeley psychologist named Donald McKinnon launched a path-breaking study. He wanted to identify the unique characteristics of highly creative people in art, science, and business, so he studied a group of people whose work involves all three fields, architects. To start, McKinnon and his colleagues asked five independent architecture experts to submit a list of the 40 most creative architects in the United States. Although they never spoke to one another, the experts achieved remarkably high consensus. They could have nominated up to 200 architects in total, but after accounting for overlap, their lists featured just 86. More than half of those architects were nominated by more than one expert, more than a third by the majority of the experts, and 15% by all five experts. From there, 40 of the country's most creative architects agreed to be dissected psychologically. McKinnon's team compared them with 84 other architects who were successful but not highly creative, matching the creative and ordinary architects on age and geographic location. All of the architects traveled to Berkeley, where they spent three full days opening up their minds to McKinnon's team and to science. They filled out a battery of personality questionnaires, experienced stressful social situations, took difficult problem-solving tests, and answered exhaustive interview questions about their entire life histories. McKinnon's team poured over mountains of data, using pseudonyms for each architect so they would remain blind to who was highly creative and who was not. One group of architects emerged as significantly more, responsible, sincere, reliable, dependable, with more, good character, and, sympathetic concern for others, than the other. The karma principle suggests that it should be the creative architects, but it wasn't. It was the ordinary architects. McKinnon found that the creative architects stood out as substantially more, demanding, aggressive, and self-centered, than the comparison group. The creative architects had whopping egos and responded aggressively and defensively to criticism. In later studies, the same patterns emerged from comparisons of creative and less creative scientists.
the creative scientists scored significantly higher in dominance, hostility, and psychopathic deviance. Highly creative scientists were rated by observers as creating and exploiting dependency in others. Even the highly creative scientists themselves agreed with statements like, I tend to slight the contribution of others and take undue credit for myself, and, I tend to be sarcastic and disparaging in describing the worth of other researchers. Takers have a knack for generating creative ideas and championing them in the face of opposition. Because they have supreme confidence in their own opinions, they feel free of the shackles of social approval that constrict the imaginations of many people. This is a distinctive signature of George Meyer's comedy. In 2002, he wrote, directed, and starred in a small play called Up Your Giggy. In his monologues, he called God, a ridiculous superstition, invented by frightened cavemen, and referred to marriage as, a stagnant cauldron of fermented resentments, scared and judgmental conformity, exaggerated concern for the children and the secret dredging up of erotic images from past lovers in a desperate and heartbreaking attempt to make spousal sex even possible. The secret to creativity, via taker. Not so fast. Meyer may harbor a cynical sense of humor, deep-seated suspicion about time-honored traditions, and a few past indiscretions, but in a Hollywood universe dominated by takers, he has spent much of his career in giver style. It started early in life, growing up, he was an Eagle Scout and an altar boy. At Harvard, Meyer majored in biochemistry and was accepted to medical school, but decided not to attend. He was turned off by the hypercompetitive pre-med students he met in college, who would regularly sabotage each other's experiments, so lame. After being elected president of the Lampoon, when peers attempted to depose him, Owen notes that, Meyer not only survived that coup but also, characteristically, became a close friend of his principal rival. After graduating and failing at the dog track, Meyer worked in a cancer research lab and as a substitute teacher. When I asked Meyer what drew him to comedy, he said, I love to make people laugh, entertain people, and try to make the world a little better. Meyer has used his comedic talent to promote social and environmental responsibility. In 1992, an early Simpsons episode that Meyer wrote, Mr. Lissa Goes to Washington, was nominated for an Environmental Media Award, granted to the best episodic comedy on television with a pro-environmental message. During his tenure, The Simpsons won six of these awards. In 1995, The Simpsons won a Genesis Award from the Humane Society for raising public awareness of animal issues. Meyer is a vegetarian who practices yoga, and in 2005 he co-wrote Earth to America, a TBS special that utilized comedy as a vehicle for raising awareness about global warming and related environmental issues. He has done extensive work for Conservation International, producing humorous PowerPoint lectures to promote biodiversity. In 2007, when scientists discovered a new species of moss frogs in Sri Lanka, they named it after Meyer's daughter, honoring his contributions to the global amphibian assessment to protect frogs. Even more impressive than Meyer's work on behalf of the planet is how he works with other people. His big break came when he was working on the Letterman movie script in 1988. To provide some variety in his workday, he wrote and self-published a humor magazine called Army Man. There were very few publications that were just trying to be funny, Meyer told humorist Eric Spitznagel, so I tried to make something that had no agenda other than to make you laugh. The first issue of Army Man was only eight pages long. Meyer typed it himself, arranged it on his bed, and started making photocopies. Then he gave away his best comedy, sending copies to about 200 friends for free. Readers found Army Man hilarious and started passing it along to their friends. The magazine quickly attracted a cult following, and it made Rolling Stone magazine's hot list of the year's best in entertainment. Soon, Meyer's friends began sending him submissions to feature in future issues. By the second issue, there was enough demand for Meyer to circulate about a thousand copies. He shut it down after the third issue, in part because he couldn't publish all of his friends' submissions but couldn't bear to turn them down. 
The first issue of Army Man debuted when The Simpsons was getting off the ground, and it made its way into the hands of executive producer Sam Simon, who was just about to recruit a writing team. Simon hired Meyer and a few of the other contributors to Army Man, and they went on to make The Simpsons a hit together. In the writer's room, George Meyer established himself as a giver. Tim Long, a Simpsons writer and five-time Emmy winner, told me that, George has the best reputation of anyone I know. He's incredibly generous in giving and helping other people. Similarly, Carolyn Omni marvels, everybody who knows George knows he is a truly good person. He has a code of honor, and he lives by this code, with a supernatural amount of integrity. George Meyer's success highlights that givers can be every bit as creative as takers. By studying his habits in collaboration, we can gain a rich appreciation of how givers work in ways that contribute to their own success, and the success of those around them. But to develop a complete understanding of what givers do effectively in collaboration, it's important to compare them with takers. The research on creative architects suggests that takers often have the confidence to generate original ideas that buck traditions and fight uphill battles to champion these ideas. But does this independence come at a price? Flying solo. In the 20th century, perhaps no person was more emblematic of eminent creativity than Frank Lloyd Wright. In 1991, Wright was recognized as the greatest American architect of all time by the American Institute of Architects. He had an extraordinarily productive career, designing the famous Fallingwater House near Pittsburgh, the Guggenheim Museum, and more than a thousand other structures, roughly half of which were built. In a career that spanned seven decades, he completed an average of more than 140 designs and 70 structures per decade. Although Wright was prolific throughout the first quarter of the 20th century, beginning in 1924, he took a nine-year nosedive. As of 1925, Wright's career had dwindled to a few houses in Los Angeles, Wright sociologist Roger Friedland and architect Harold Zellman. After studying Wright's career, the psychologist Ed DeStreet Aubin concluded that the lowest Wright ever sank architecturally occurred in the years between 1924 and 1933 when he completed only two projects. Over those nine years, Wright was about 35 times less productive than usual. During one two-year period, he didn't earn a single commission, and he was, floundering professionally, notes architecture critic Christopher Hawthorne. By 1932, the world-famous Frank Lloyd Wright, was, all but unemployed, wrote biographer Brendan Gill. His last major executed commission had been a house for his cousin, in 1929, and, he was continuously in debt, to the point of struggling, to find the wherewithal to buy groceries. What caused America's greatest architect to languish? Wright was one of the architects invited to participate in Mackinnon's study of creativity. Although he declined the invitation, the portrait of the creative architect that emerged from Mackinnon's analysis was the spitting image of Wright. In his designs, Frank Lloyd Wright appeared to be a humanitarian. He introduced the concept of organic architecture, striving to foster harmony between people and the environments in which they lived. But in his interactions with other people, he operated like a taker. Experts believe that as an apprentice, Wright designed at least nine bootleg houses, violating the terms of his contract that prohibited independent work. To hide the illegal work, Wright reportedly persuaded one of his fellow draftsmen to sign off on several of the houses. At one point, Wright promised his son John a salary for working as an assistant on several projects. When John asked him to be paid, Wright sent him a bill itemizing the total amount of money that John had cost over the course of his life, from birth to the present. When designing the famous Fallingwater house, Wright stalled for months. When the client, Edgar Kaufman, finally called Wright to announce that he was driving 140 miles to see his progress, Wright claimed the house was finished. But when Kaufman arrived, Wright had not even completed a drawing, let alone the house. In the span of a few hours, before Kaufman's eyes, Wright sketched out a detailed design. Kaufman had commissioned a weekend cottage at one of his family's favorite picnic spots, where they could see a waterfall. 
Wright had a radically different idea in mind. He drew the house on a rock on top of the waterfall, which would be out of sight from the house. He convinced Kaufman to accept it, and eventually charged him $125,000 for it, more than triple the $35,000 specified in the contract. It's unlikely that a giver would have ever been comfortable deviating so far from a client's expectations, let alone convincing him to endorse it enthusiastically and charging extra for it. It was a taker's mindset, it seems, that gave Wright the gall to develop a truly original vision and sell it to a client. But the very same taker tendencies that served Wright well in falling water also precipitated his nine-year slump. For two decades, until 1911, Wright made his name as an architect living in Chicago and Oak Park, Illinois, where he benefited from the assistance of craftspeople and sculptors. In 1911, he designed Taliesin, an estate in a remote Wisconsin valley. Believing he could excel alone, he moved out there. But as time passed, Wright spun his wheels during, long years of enforced idleness, Gill wrote. At Taliesin, Wright lacked access to talented apprentices. The isolation he chose by creating Taliesin, this street, Aubin observes, left him without the elements that had become essential to his life architectural commissions and skillful workers to help him complete his building designs. Frank Lloyd Wright's drought lasted until he gave up on independence and began to work interdependently again with talented collaborators. It wasn't his own idea. His wife Oljavana convinced him to start a fellowship for apprentices to help him with his work. When apprentices joined him in 1932, his productivity soared, and he was soon working on the Fallingwater House, which would be seen by many as the greatest work of architecture in modern history. Wright ran his fellowship program for a quarter century, but even then, he struggled to appreciate how much he depended on apprentices. He refused to pay apprentices, requiring them to do cooking, cleaning, and fieldwork. Wright, was a great architect, explained his former apprentice Edgar Taffel, who worked on Fallingwater, but he needed people like myself to make his designs work, although you couldn't tell him that. Wright's story exposes the gap between our natural tendencies to attribute creative success to individuals and the collaborative reality that underpins much truly great work. This gap isn't limited to strictly creative fields. Even in seemingly independent jobs that rely on raw brainpower, our success depends more on others than we realize. For the past decade, several Harvard professors have studied cardiac surgeons in hospitals and security analysts in investment banks. Both groups specialize in knowledge work. They need serious smarts to rewire patients' hearts and organize complex information for stock recommendations. According to management guru Peter Drucker, these knowledge workers, unlike manual workers in manufacturing, own the means of production, they carry that knowledge in their heads and can therefore take it with them. But carrying knowledge isn't actually so easy. In one study, professors Robert Huckman and Gary Pisano wanted to know whether surgeons get better with practice. Since surgeons are in high demand, they perform procedures at multiple hospitals. Over a two-year period, Huckman and Pisano tracked 38,577 procedures performed by 203 cardiac surgeons at 43 different hospitals. They focused on coronary artery bypass grafts, where surgeons open a patient's chest and attach a vein from a leg or a section of chest artery to bypass a blockage in an artery to the heart. On average, 3% of patients died during these procedures. When Huckman and Pisano examined the data, they discovered a remarkable pattern. Overall, the surgeons didn't get better with practice. They only got better at the specific hospital where they practiced. For every procedure they handled at a given hospital, the risk of patient mortality dropped by 1%. But the risk of mortality stayed the same at other hospitals. The surgeons couldn't take their performance with them. They weren't getting better at performing coronary artery bypass grafts. They were becoming more familiar with particular nurses and anesthesiologists, learning about their strengths and weaknesses, habits, and styles. This familiarity helped them avoid patient deaths, but it didn't carry over to other hospitals. 
To reduce the risk of patient mortality, the surgeons needed relationships with specific surgical team members. While Huckman and Pisano were collecting their hospital data, down the hall at Harvard, a similar study was underway in the financial sector. In investment banks, security analysts conduct research to produce earnings forecasts and make recommendations to money management firms about whether to buy or sell a company's stock. Star analysts carry superior knowledge and expertise that they should be able to use regardless of who their colleagues are. As investment research executive Fred Frankel explains, analysts are one of the most mobile Wall Street professions because their expertise is portable. I mean, you've got it when you're here and you've got it when you're there. The client base doesn't change. You need your Rolodex and your files, and you're in business. To test this assumption, Boris Groisberg studied more than a thousand equity and fixed income security analysts over a nine-year period at 78 different firms. The analysts were ranked in effectiveness by thousands of clients at investment management institutions based on the quality of their earnings estimates, industry knowledge, written reports, service, stock selection, and accessibility and responsiveness. The top three analysts in each of 80 industry sectors were ranked as stars, earning between $2 million and $5 million. Groisberg and his colleagues tracked what happened when the analysts switched firms. Over the nine-year period, 366 analysts, 9%, moved, so it was possible to see whether the stars maintained their success in new firms. Even though they were supposed to be individual stars, their performance wasn't portable. When star analysts moved to a different firm, their performance dropped, and it stayed lower for at least five years. In the first year after the move, the star analysts were 5% less likely to be ranked first, 6% less likely to be ranked second, 1% less likely to be ranked third, and 6% more likely to be unranked. Even five years after the move, the stars were 5% less likely to be ranked first and 8% more likely to be unranked. On average, firms lost about $24 million by hiring star analysts. Contrary to the beliefs of Frankel and other industry insiders, Groisberg and his colleagues conclude that, hiring stars is advantageous neither to stars themselves, in terms of their performance, nor to hiring companies in terms of their market value. But some of the star analysts did maintain their success. If they moved with their teams, the stars showed no decline at all in performance. The star analysts who moved solo had a 5% probability of being ranked first, while the star analysts who moved with teammates had a 10% probability of being ranked first, the same as those who didn't move at all. In another study, Groisberg and his colleagues found that analysts were more likely to maintain their star performance if they worked with high-quality colleagues in their teams and departments. The star analysts relied on knowledgeable colleagues for information and new ideas. The star investment analysts and the cardiac surgeons depended heavily on collaborators who knew them well or had strong skills of their own. If Frank Lloyd Wright had been more of a giver than a taker, could he have avoided the nine years in which his income and reputation plummeted? George Meyer thinks so. I wish I could hate you. After Meyer left Saturday Night Live in 1987, he hightailed it out of New York City and moved to Boulder, Colorado, to work on the Letterman movie script alone. Just like Frank Lloyd Wright, Meyer had isolated himself from his collaborators. But in stark contrast to Wright, Meyer recognized that he needed other people to succeed. He knew his performance was interdependent, not independent, his ability to make people laugh was due in part to collaborating with fellow comedy writers. So he reached out to people who had worked with him at the Lampoon and on his past shows, inviting them to contribute to Army Man. I believe that collaboration is such a beautiful thing, especially in comedy, Meyer told me. In a community of funny people, you can get that rare synergy, jokes you never could have come up with on your own. Four colleagues ended up helping Meyer with the inaugural issue. One of those colleagues was Jack Handy, who contributed an early installment of, Deep Thoughts, which went on to become a wildly popular series of jokes. 
Meyer published Deep Thoughts three years before they became famous on Saturday Night Live, and they contributed to the success of Army Man. The juxtaposition of George Meyer with Frank Lloyd Wright reveals how givers and takers think differently about success. Wright thought he could take his architectural genius from Chicago, where he worked with a team of experts, to a remote part of Wisconsin, where he was largely alone. Wright's family motto was, truth against the world, and it's a familiar theme in Western culture. We tend to privilege the lone genius who generates ideas that enthrall us, or change our world. According to research by a trio of Stanford psychologists, Americans see independence as a symbol of strength, viewing interdependence as a sign of weakness. This is particularly true of takers, who tend to see themselves as superior to and separate from others. If they depend too much on others, takers believe, they'll be vulnerable to being outdone. Like Wright, the star analysts who left their investment banks without their successful teams, or without considering the quality of the new teams they were joining, fell into this trap. Givers reject the notion that interdependence is weak. Givers are more likely to see interdependence as a source of strength, a way to harness the skills of multiple people for a greater good. This appreciation of interdependence heavily influenced the way that Meyer collaborated. He recognized that if he could contribute effectively to the group, everyone would be better off, so he went out of his way to support his colleagues. When Meyer wrote for Saturday Night Live in the mid-1980s as a virtual unknown, he was almost always in the office, making himself available to give feedback. He ended up helping famous comedians like John Lovitz, Phil Hartman, and Randy Quaid with their writing and delivery. Behind the scenes on Saturday Night Live, many writers were competing to get their sketches on the show. There was a Darwinian element, Meyer admits. There might be 10 sketches per show, and we would have 35 or 40 sketches on the table. There was a bit of a battle, and I just tried to be a good collaborator. When big stars like Madonna were slated to appear on the show, his colleagues flocked to submit sketches. Meyer submitted material for those shows, but he also put in extra effort on sketches for less electric guests, who tended to attract fewer sketches. Meyer took it upon himself to develop compelling sketches for less glamorous guests like Jimmy Breslin because that was where the show needed him most. I just wanted to be a good soldier, Meyer says. When people weren't as excited, that's when I felt I had to step up my game. He rose to the occasion, co-writing a hilarious sketch for Breslin that had James Bond villains on a talk show. Breslin played Goldfinger, offering tips and designing fortresses and griping about having his schemes thwarted by Bond. The sketch predated the hit Austin Powers spoof of Bond movies by more than a decade. Meyer's pattern of giving continued on The Simpsons. Among writers, the most popular task was typically to write the first draft of an episode, as it allowed them to put their creative stamp on it. Meyer would generate plenty of ideas for episodes, but he rarely wrote the first draft. Instead, feeling that his skills were needed more in rewriting, he took responsibility for the dirty work of spending months helping to rewrite and revise each episode. This is a defining feature of how givers collaborate. They take on the tasks that are in the group's best interest, not necessarily their own personal interests. This makes their groups better off. Studies show that on average, from sales teams to paper mill crews to restaurants, the more giving group members do, the higher the quantity and quality of their group's products and services. But it's not just their groups that get rewarded. Like Adam Rifkin, successful givers expand the pie in ways that benefit themselves as well as their groups. Extensive research reveals that people who give their time and knowledge regularly to help their colleagues end up earning more raises and promotions in a wide range of settings, from banks to manufacturing companies. On The Simpsons, I think George surrendered himself to the show, Tim Long says. Intuitively, he understood that the best thing for him was for the show to be as good as possible. There's a name for Meyer's actions. In the world of mountaineering, it's called expedition behavior. The term was coined by the National Outdoor Leadership School NOLS, which has provided wilderness education to thousands of people, including crews of NASA astronauts. 
Expedition behavior involves putting the group's goals and mission first, and showing the same amount of concern for others as you do for yourself. Jeff Ashby, a NASA Space Shuttle commander who has flown more than 400 orbits around Earth, says that, expedition behavior, being selfless, generous, and putting the team ahead of yourself, is what helps us succeed in space more than anything else. John Cannonjeter, who directs leadership at NOLS, adds that expedition behavior is, not a zero-sum game, when you give it away, you gain more in response. Part of Meyer's success came from expanding the pie, the more he contributed to the success of his shows, the more success there was for the whole team to share. But Meyer's expedition behavior also changed the way his colleagues saw him. When givers put a group's interests ahead of their own, they signal that their primary goal is to benefit the group. As a result, givers earn the respect of their collaborators. If Meyer had competed to draft his strongest sketches for Madonna, his fellow writers might have viewed him as a threat to their own status and careers. By doing his best work for less coveted guests, Meyer was doing his colleagues a favor. Takers no longer felt that they needed to compete with him, matchers felt that they owed him, and givers saw him as one of them. When you were breaking your story or rewriting your script in the room, George was always a welcome addition to the group, says Don Payne, a Simpsons writer since 1998. He would always come up with something that would make your scripts better. That's what draws people to him, they respect and admire him. In addition to building goodwill, volunteering for unpopular tasks and offering feedback gave Meyer the chance to demonstrate his comedic gifts without leading colleagues to feel insecure. In one study, University of Minnesota researchers Eugene Kim and Teresa Glom found that highly talented people tend to make others jealous, placing themselves at risk of being disliked, resented, ostracized, and undermined. But if these talented people are also givers, they no longer have a target on their backs. Instead, givers are appreciated for their contributions to the group. By taking on tasks that his colleagues didn't want, Meyer was able to dazzle them with his wit and humor without eliciting envy. Meyer summarizes his code of honor as, 1. Show up. 2. Work hard. 3. Be kind. 4. Take the high road. As he contributed in ways that revealed his skills without spawning jealousy, colleagues began to admire and trust his comedic genius. People started to see him as somebody who wasn't just motivated personally, Tim Long explains. You don't think of him as a competitor. He's someone you can think of on a higher plane, and can trust creatively. Carolyn Omini adds, compared to other writers' rooms have been in, I would say The Simpsons tends to look longer for jokes. I think it's because we have writers, like George, who will say, no, that's not quite right, even if it's late, even if we're all tired. I think that's an important quality. We need those people, like George, who aren't afraid to say, no, this isn't good enough. We can do better. In a classic article, the psychologist Edwin Hollander argued that when people act generously in groups, they earn idiosyncrasy credits, positive impressions that accumulate in the minds of group members. Since many people think like matchers, when they work in groups, it's very common for them to keep track of each member's credits and debits. Once a group member earns idiosyncrasy credits through giving, matchers grant that member a license to deviate from a group's norms or expectations. As Berkeley sociologist Rob Willer summarizes, groups reward individual sacrifice. On The Simpsons, Meyer amassed plenty of idiosyncrasy credits, earning latitude to contribute original ideas and shift the creative direction of the show. One of the best things about developing that credibility was if I wanted to try something that was fairly strange, people would be willing to at least give it a shot at the table read, Meyer reflects. They ended up not rewriting my stuff as much as they had early on, because they knew I had a decent track record. I think people saw that my heart was in the right place, my intentions were good. That goes a long way. In line with Meyer's experience, research shows that givers get extra credit when they offer ideas that challenge the status quo. In studies that I conducted with colleagues Sharon Parker and Catherine Collins, when takers presented suggestions for improvement, 
colleagues were skeptical of their intentions, writing them off as self-serving. But when ideas that might be threatening were proposed by givers, their colleagues listened and rewarded them for speaking up, knowing they were motivated by a genuine desire to contribute. When I think about George in a writer's room, niece is not what I would say. He's spicier than that. Carolyn Omini laughs. But when George is tough, you know it is only because he cares so much about getting it right. In 1995, during the sixth Simpsons season, Meyer told his colleagues he would be leaving the show at the end of the season. Rather than seeing his departure as an opportunity for personal advancement, the writers didn't want to let him go. They quickly joined forces to recruit him back, persuading him to return as a consultant. Soon they had him all the way back as a full-time writer. At a very early point, they realized that George was too important to let out of the room, John Biddy told the Harvard Crimson. Nobody's opinion is more valued than George's. Looking back and his experiences working with Meyer, Tim Long adds that, there's something magical about getting the reputation as someone who cares about others more than yourself. It redounds to your benefit in countless ways. Claiming the lion's share of the credit. Although Meyer's giving strengthened his reputation in the inner circles of show business, he toiled in anonymity in the outside world. In Hollywood, there's an easy solution to this problem. Writers gain prominence by claiming credits on as many television episodes as possible, which proves that the ideas and scenes were their brainchild. George Meyer shaped and sculpted more than 300 Simpsons episodes, but in quiet defiance of Hollywood norms, he's only credited as a writer on 12 of them. On hundreds of episodes, other writers got the credit for Meyer's ideas and jokes. George never took writing credits on The Simpsons, even though he was an idea machine, Tim Long told me. People tend to come up with ideas and jealously guard them, but George would create ideas, give them to someone else and never take credit. There's a crucial stretch of The Simpsons over 10 years where he's not credited with a single joke, even though he was responsible for a huge number of them. Asterisk. By giving away credit, Meyer compromised his visibility. For a long time, George's towering contribution to what some see as the most important TV show of the period was not as well known as it should have been, Long recalls. He was generating a tremendous amount of material, and not really getting credit. Should Meyer have claimed more credit for his efforts? Hogging credit certainly seemed to work for Frank Lloyd Wright. At Taliesin, Wright insisted that his name be on every document as head architect, even when apprentices took the lead on a project. He threatened his apprentices that if they didn't credit him first and submit all documents for his approval, he would accuse them of forgery and take them to court. Yet if we take a closer look at Meyer's experience, we might draw the conclusion that when Wright had success as an architect, it was in spite of taking credit, not because of it. Meyer's reluctance to take credit might have cost him some fame in the short run, but he wasn't worried about it. He earned credit as an executive producer, landing a half dozen Emmys for his work on The Simpsons, and felt there was plenty of credit to go around. A lot of people feel they're diminished if there are too many names on a script, like everybody's trying to share a dog bowl, Meyer says. But that's not really the way it works. The thing about credit is that it's not zero-sum. There's room for everybody, and you'll shine if other people are shining. Time would prove Meyer right. Despite his short-term sacrifices, Meyer ended up receiving the credit he deserved. Meyer was virtually unknown outside Hollywood until 2000, when David Owen published his profile in The New Yorker, with the headline describing Meyer as, the funniest man behind the funniest show on TV. When Owen contacted key Simpsons writers for interviews, they jumped at the chance to sing Meyer's praises. As Tim Long puts it, it makes me incredibly happy to extol George's virtues, even if I'm going to embarrass him. Just as matchers grant a bonus to givers in collaborations, they impose a tax on takers. In a study of Slovenian companies led by Mate Cern, employees who hid knowledge from their co-workers struggled to generate creative ideas because their co-workers responded in kind, refusing to share information with them. 
To illustrate, consider the career of the medical researcher Jonas Salk, who began working to develop a polio vaccine in 1948. The following year, scientists John Enders, Frederick Robbins, and Thomas Weller successfully grew the polio virus in test tubes, paving the way for mass producing a vaccine based on a live virus. By 1952, Salk's research lab at the University of Pittsburgh had developed a vaccine that appeared to be effective. That year witnessed the worst polio epidemic in U.S. history. The virus infected more than 57,000 people, leading to more than 3,000 deaths and 20,000 cases of paralysis. Over the next three years, Salk's mentor, Thomas Francis, directed the evaluation of a field trial of the Salk vaccine, testing it on more than 1.8 million children with the help of 220,000 volunteers, 64,000 school workers, and 20,000 health care professionals. On April 12, 1955, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Francis made an announcement that sent a ripple of hope throughout the country, the Salk vaccine was, safe, effective and potent. Within two years, the vaccine was disseminated through the Herculean efforts of the March of Dimes, and the incidence of polio fell by nearly 90%. By 1961, there were just 161 cases in the United States. The vaccine had similar effects worldwide. Jonas Salk became an international hero. But at the historic 1955 press conference, Salk gave a valedictory speech that jeopardized his relationships and his reputation in the scientific community. He didn't acknowledge the important contributions of Enders, Robbins, and Weller, who had won a Nobel Prize a year earlier for their groundbreaking work that enabled Salk's team to produce the vaccine. Even more disconcertingly, Salk gave no credit to the six researchers in his lab who were major contributors to his efforts to develop the vaccine, Byron Bennett, Percival Baisley, L. James Lewis, Julius Jungner, Elsie Ward, and Francis Yurochko. Salk's team left the press conference in tears. As historian David Oshinsky writes in Polio, an American story, Salk never acknowledged the people in his own lab. This group, seated proudly together in the packed auditorium, would feel painfully snubbed. Salk's co-workers from Pittsburgh had come expecting to be honored by their boss. A tribute seemed essential, and long overdue. This was especially true from a matcher's perspective. One colleague told a reporter, at the beginning, I saw him as a father figure. And at the end, an evil father figure. Over time, it became clear that Julius Jungner felt particularly slighted. Everybody likes to get credit for what they've done, Jungner told Oshinsky. It was a big shock. The snub fractured their relationship. Jungner left Salk's lab in 1957 and went on to make a number of important contributions to virology and immunology. In 1993, they finally crossed paths at the University of Pittsburgh, and Jungner shared his feelings. We were in the audience, your closest colleagues and devoted associates, who worked hard and faithfully for the same goal that you desired, Jungner began. Do you remember whom you mentioned and whom you left out? Do you realize how devastated we were at that moment and ever afterward when you persisted in making your co-workers invisible? Jungner reflected that Salk was clearly shaken by these memories and offered little response. Jonas Salk's moment of taking sole credit haunted him for the rest of his career. He launched the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, where hundreds of researchers continue to push the envelope of humanitarian science today. But Salk's own productivity waned. Later in his career, he tried unsuccessfully to develop an AIDS vaccine, and he was shunned by his colleagues. He never won a Nobel Prize, and he was never elected to the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. Asterisk, in the coming years, almost every prominent polio researcher would gain entrance, Oshinsky writes. The main exception, of course, was Jonas Salk. As one observer put it, Salk had broken the, unwritten commandments, of scientific research, which included, thou shalt give credit to others. According to Jungner, people really held it against him that he had grandstanded like that and really done the most uncollegial thing that you can imagine. Salk thought his colleagues were jealous. 
If someone does something and gets credit for it, then there is this tendency to have this competitive response, he acknowledged in rare comments about the incident. I was not unscathed by Ann Arbor. But Salk passed away in 1995 without ever acknowledging the contributions of his colleagues. Ten years later, in 2005, the University of Pittsburgh held an event to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the vaccine announcement. With Jungner in attendance, Salk's son, AIDS researcher Peter Salk, finally set the record straight. It was not the accomplishment of one man. It was the accomplishment of a dedicated and skilled team, Peter Salk said. This was a collaborative effort. It appears that Jonas Salk made the same mistake as Frank Lloyd Wright, he saw himself as independent rather than interdependent. Instead of earning the idiosyncrasy credits that George Meyer attained, Salk was penalized by his colleagues for taking sole credit. Why didn't Salk ever credit the contributions of his colleagues to the development of the polio vaccine? It's possible that he was jealously guarding his own accomplishments, as a taker would naturally do, but I believe there's a more convincing answer, he didn't feel they deserved credit. Why would that be? The responsibility bias. To understand this puzzle, we need to take a trip to Canada, where psychologists have been asking married couples to put their relationships on the line. Think about your marriage, or your most recent romantic relationship. Of the total effort that goes into the relationship, from making dinner and planning dates to taking out the garbage and resolving conflicts, what percentage of the work do you handle? Let's say you claim responsibility for 55% of the total effort in the relationship. If you're perfectly calibrated, your partner will claim responsibility for 45%, and your estimates will add up to 100%. In actuality, psychologists Michael Ross and Fury Sicali found that three out of every four couples add up to significantly more than 100%. Partners overestimate their own contributions. This is known as the responsibility bias, exaggerating our own contributions relative to others' inputs. It's a mistake to which takers are especially vulnerable, and it's partially driven by the desire to see and present ourselves positively. In line with this idea, Jonas Salk certainly didn't avoid the spotlight. One of his great gifts, Oshinsky writes, was a knack for putting himself forward in a manner that made him seem genuinely indifferent to his fame. Reporters and photographers would always find Salk grudging but available. He would warn them not to waste too much of his time, he would grouse about the important work they were keeping him from doing, and then, having lodged his formulaic protest, he would fully accommodate. But there's another factor at play that's both more powerful and more flattering, information discrepancy. We have more access to information about our own contributions than the contributions of others. We see all of our own efforts, but we only witness a subset of our partner's efforts. When we think about who deserves the credit, we have more knowledge of our own contributions. Indeed, when asked to list each spouse's specific contributions to their marriage, on average, people were able to come up with 11 of their own contributions, but only 8 of their partner's contributions. When Salk claimed sole credit for the polio vaccine, he had vivid memories of the blood, sweat, and tears that he invested in developing the vaccine, but comparatively little information about his colleagues' contributions. He literally hadn't experienced what Jungner and the rest of the team did, and he wasn't present for the Nobel Prize-winning discovery that Enders, Robbins, and Weller made. Even when people are well-intentioned, writes LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman, they tend to overvalue their own contributions and undervalue those of others. This responsibility bias is a major source of failed collaborations. Professional relationships disintegrate when entrepreneurs, inventors, investors, and executives feel that their partners are not giving them the credit they deserve, or doing their fair share. In Hollywood, between 1993 and 1997 alone, more than 400 screenplays, roughly a third of all submitted, went to credit arbitration. If you're a taker, your driving motivation is to make sure you get more than you give, which means you're carefully counting every contribution that you make. It's all too easy to believe that you've done the lion's share of the work, overlooking what your colleagues contribute. 
George Meyer was able to overcome the responsibility bias. The Simpsons has contributed many words to the English lexicon, the most famous being Homer's Doe. Response to an event that causes mental or physical anguish. Meyer didn't invent that word, but he did coin yoink, the familiar phrase that Simpsons characters utter when they snatch an item from another character's hands. In 2007, the humor magazine Cracked ran a feature on the top words created by the Simpsons. Making the list were classics like cromulent describing something that's fine, acceptable, or illegitimately legitimate, and tomico, a crossbreed of tomato and tobacco made by Homer, first suggested in a 1959 Scientific American piece, and actually crossbred in 2003 by a Simpsons fan named Rob Bauer. But the top invented word on the list was ma, the expression of pure indifference that debuted in the sixth season of the show. In one episode, Marge Simpson is fascinated by a weaving loom at a Renaissance fair, having studied weaving in high school. She weaves a message, Hi Bart, I am weaving on a loom. Bart's response, meh. Six years later, an episode aired in which Lisa Simpson actually spells out the word. Meh has appeared in numerous dictionaries, from Macmillan, used for showing that you do not care what happens or that you are not particularly interested in something, to dictionary.com, an expression of boredom or apathy, to Collins English Dictionary, an interjection to suggest indifference or boredom, or as an adjective to say something is mediocre or a person is unimpressed. Several years ago, George Meyer was caught by surprise when a Simpsons writer shared a memory with him about the episode in which Meh first appeared. He reminded me I had worked on that episode, and he thought I came up with the word Meh. I didn't remember it. When I asked Tim Long who created Meh, he was pretty confident it was George Meyer. I'm almost sure he invented Meh. It's everywhere, most people don't even realize it started with The Simpsons. Eventually, conversations with writers jogged Meyer's memory. I was trying to think of a word that would be the easiest word to say with minimal effort, just a parting of the lips and air would come out. Why didn't Meyer have a better memory of his contributions? As a giver, his focus was on achieving a collective result that entertained others, not on claiming personal responsibility for that result. He would suggest as many lines, jokes, and words as possible, letting others run with them and incorporate them into their scripts. His attention centered on improving the overall quality of the script, rather than on tracking who was responsible for it. A lot of the stuff is just like a basketball assist. When somebody would say, George, that was yours, I genuinely did not know, Meyer says. I tended to not be able to remember the stuff that I had done, so I wasn't always saying when I did this and that. I was saying when we did this and that. I think it's good to get into the habit of doing that. Research shows that it's not terribly difficult for matchers and takers to develop this habit. Recall that the responsibility bias occurs because we have more information about our own contributions than others. The key to balancing our responsibility judgments is to focus our attention on what others have contributed. All you need to do is make a list of what your partner contributes before you estimate your own contribution. Studies indicate that when employees think about how much help they receive from their bosses before thinking about how much they contribute to their bosses, their estimates of their bosses' contributions double, from under 17% to over 33%. Bring together a work group of three to six people and ask each member to estimate the percentage of the total work that he or she does. Add up their estimates, and the average total is over 140%. Ask them to reflect on each member's contributions before their own, and the average total drops to 123%. Givers like Meyer do this naturally, they take care to recognize what other people contribute. In one study, psychologist Michael McCall asked people to fill out a survey measuring whether they were givers or takers, and to make decisions in pairs about the importance of different items for surviving in the desert. He randomly told half of the pairs that they failed and the other half that they succeeded. The takers blamed their partners for failures and claimed credit for successes. The givers shouldered the blame for failures and gave their partners more credit for successes.
This is George Meyer's modus operandi. He's incredibly tough on himself when things go badly, but quick to congratulate others when things go well. Bad comedy hurts George physically, Tim Long says. Meyer wants each joke to make people laugh, and many to make them think. Although he holds other people to the same high standards that he sets for himself, he's more forgiving of their mistakes. Early in his career, Meyer was fired from a show called Not Necessarily the News after six weeks. Twenty years later, he ran into the boss who fired him. She apologized, firing him was clearly a mistake, and braced herself for Meyer to be angry. As he shared the story with me, Meyer laughed, it was just lovely to see her again. I said, come on, look where we are, all is forgiven. There are a few people in Hollywood who thrive on driving their enemies' faces into the dirt. That's such a hollow motivation. And you don't want to have all these people out there trying to undermine you. In the Simpsons rewrite room, being more forgiving of others than of himself helped Meyer get the best ideas out of others. I tried to create a climate in the room where everybody feels that they can contribute, that it's okay to fall on your face many, many times, he says. This is known as psychological safety, the belief that you can take a risk without being penalized or punished. Research by Harvard Business School professor Amy Edmondson shows that in the type of psychologically safe environment that Meyer helped create, people learn and innovate more. Asterisk and its givers who often create such an environment. In one study, engineers who shared ideas without expecting anything in return were more likely to play a major role in innovation, as they made it safe to exchange information. Don Payne recalls that when he and fellow writer John Frink joined The Simpsons, they were intimidated by the talented veterans on the show, but Meyer made it safe to present their ideas. George was incredibly supportive, and took us under his wing. He made it very easy to join in and participate, encouraged us to pitch and didn't denigrate us. He listened, and asked for our opinions. When revising scripts, many comedy writers cut material ruthlessly, leaving the people who wrote that material psychologically wounded. Meyer, on the other hand, says he, tried to specialize in the emotional support of other people. When writers were freaking out about their scripts being rewritten, he was often the one to console them and calm them down. I was always dealing with people in extremis, I would often talk people down from panic, Meyer observes. I got good at soothing them, and showing them a different way to look at the situation. At the end of the day, even if he was trashing their work, they knew he cared about them as people. Carolyn Omini comments that, George does not mince words, he'll come right out and tell you if he thinks the joke you pitched is dumb, but you never feel he's saying you're dumb. Tim Long told me that when you give Meyer a script to read, it's as if you just handed him a baby, and it's his responsibility to tell you if your baby's sick. He really cares about great writing, and about you. The perspective gap. If overcoming the responsibility bias gives us a clearer understanding of others' contributions, what is it that allows us to offer support to colleagues in collaborations, where emotions can run high and people often take criticism personally? Sharing credit is only one piece of successful group work. Meyer's related abilities to console fellow writers when their work was being cut, and to create a psychologically safe environment, are a hallmark of another important step that givers take in collaboration, seeing beyond the perspective gap. In an experiment led by Northwestern University psychologist Lauren Nordgren, people predicted how painful it would be to sit in a freezing room for five hours. They made their predictions under two different conditions, warm and cold. When the warm group estimated how much pain they would experience in the freezing room, they had an arm in a bucket of warm water. The cold group also made their judgments with an arm in a bucket, but it was filled with ice water. Which group would expect to feel the most pain in the freezing room? As you probably guessed, it was the cold group. People anticipated that the freezing room would be 14% more painful when they had their arm in a bucket of ice water than a bucket of warm water. After literally feeling the cold for a minute, they knew several hours would be awful. But there was a third group of people who experienced cold under different circumstances. 
They stuck an arm in a bucket of ice water, but then took the arm out and filled out a separate questionnaire. After 10 minutes had passed, they estimated how painful the freezing room would be. Their predictions should have resembled the cold groups, having felt the freezing temperature just 10 minutes earlier, but they didn't. They were identical to the warm group. Even though they had felt the cold 10 minutes earlier, once they weren't cold anymore, they could no longer imagine it. This is a perspective gap. When we're not experiencing a psychologically or physically intense state, we dramatically underestimate how much it will affect us. For instance, evidence shows that physicians consistently think their patients are feeling less pain than they actually are. Without being in a state of pain themselves, physicians can't fully realize what it's like to be in that state. In a San Francisco hospital, a respected oncologist was concerned about a patient. He's not as mentally clear as he was yesterday. The patient was old, and he had advanced metastatic cancer. The oncologist decided to order a spinal tap to see what was wrong, in the hopes of prolonging the patient's life. Maybe he has an infection, meningitis, a brain abscess, something treatable. The neurologist on call, Robert Burton, had his doubts. The patient's prognosis was grim, and the spinal tap would be extremely painful. But the oncologist was not ready to throw in the towel. When Burden entered the room with the spinal tap tray, the patient's family protested. Please, no more, they said together. The patient, too frail to speak from a terminal illness, nodded, declining the spinal tap. Burden paged the oncologist and explained the family's wishes to avoid the spinal tap, but the oncologist was not ready to give up. Finally, the patient's wife grabbed Burton's arm, begging him for support in refusing the oncologist's plan to do the spinal tap. It's not what we want, the wife pleaded. The oncologist was still determined to save the patient. He explained why the spinal tap was essential, and eventually, the family and patient gave in. Burton performed the spinal tap, which was challenging to carry out and quite painful for the patient. The patient developed a pounding headache, fell into a coma and died three days later due to the cancer. Although the oncologist was a prominent expert in his field, Burden remembers him, mainly for what he taught me about in critical acceptance of believing that you, are doing good. The only way you can really know is if you ask the patient and you have a dialogue. In collaborations, takers rarely cross this perspective gap. They're so focused on their own viewpoints that they never end up seeing how others are reacting to their ideas and feedback. On the other hand, researcher Jim Barry and I discovered that in creative work, givers are motivated to benefit others, so they find ways to put themselves in other people's shoes. When George Meyer was editing the work of Simpsons animators and writers, he was facing a perspective gap. He was cutting their favorite scenes and jokes, not his own. Recognizing that he couldn't literally feel what they were feeling, he found a close substitute. He reflected on what it felt like to receive feedback and have his work revised when he was in their positions. When he joined The Simpsons in 1989, Meyer had written a Thanksgiving episode that included a dream sequence. He thought the sequence was hilarious, but Sam Simon, the showrunner at the time, didn't agree. When Simon cut the dream from the script, Meyer was furious. I flipped out. I was so enraged that Sam had to send me to do another task, just to get me out of the room. When criticizing and changing the work of animators and writers, Meyer would look back on this experience. I could relate to that sense of being eviscerated when other people were rewriting their stuff, he told me. This made him more empathetic and considerate, helping other people to simmer down from intense states and accept his revisions. Like Meyer, successful givers shift their frames of reference to the recipient's perspective. For most people, this isn't the natural starting point. Consider the common dilemma of giving a gift for a wedding or a new baby's arrival. When the recipient has created a registry, do you pick something from the registry or send a unique gift? One evening, my wife was searching for a wedding gift for some friends. She decided it was more thoughtful and considerate to find something that wasn't on their registry, and chose to send candlesticks, assuming that our friends would appreciate the unique gift. 
Personally, I was perplexed. Several years earlier, when we received wedding gifts, my wife was often disappointed when people sent unique gifts, rather than choosing items from our registry. She knew she wanted particular items, and it was quite rare for anyone to send a gift that she preferred over the ones she had actually selected. Knowing that she preferred the registry gift when she was the recipient, why did she opt for a unique gift when she was in the giving role? To get to the bottom of this puzzle, researchers Francesca Gino of Harvard and Frank Flynn of Stanford examined how senders and receivers react to registry gifts and unique gifts. They found that senders consistently underestimated how much recipients appreciated registry gifts. In one experiment, they recruited 90 people to either give or receive a gift from Amazon.com. The receivers had 24 hours to create a wish list of 10 products in the price range of $20 to $30. The senders accessed the wish lists and were randomly assigned to either choose a registry gift from the list or a unique gift an idea of their own. The senders expected that the recipients would appreciate the unique gift as somewhat more thoughtful and personal. In fact, the opposite was true. The recipients reported significantly greater appreciation of the registry gifts than the unique gifts. The same patterns emerged with friends giving and receiving wedding gifts and birthday gifts. The senders preferred to give unique gifts, but the recipients actually preferred the gifts they solicited on their registries and wish lists. Why? Research shows that when we take others' perspectives, we tend to stay within our own frames of reference, asking, how would I feel in this situation? When we're giving a gift, we imagine the joy that we would experience in receiving the gifts that we're selecting. But this isn't the same joy that the recipient will experience, because the recipient has a different set of preferences. In the giver's role, my wife loved the candlesticks she picked out. But if our friends were enamored with those candlesticks, they would have put them on their gift registry. Asterisk. To effectively help colleagues, people need to step outside their own frames of reference. As George Meyer did, they need to ask, how will the recipient feel in this situation? This capacity to see the world from another person's perspective develops very early in life. In one experiment, Berkeley psychologists Betty Ripacholi and Alison Gopnik studied 14-month-old and 18-month-old toddlers. The toddlers had two bowls of food in front of them, one with goldfish crackers and one with broccoli. The toddlers tasted food from both bowls, showing a strong preference for goldfish crackers over broccoli. Then, they watched a researcher express disgust while tasting the crackers and delight while tasting the broccoli. When the researcher held out her hand and asked for some food, the toddlers had a chance to offer either the crackers or the broccoli to the researcher. Would they travel outside their own perspectives and give her the broccoli, even though they themselves hated it? The 14-month-olds didn't, but the 18-month-olds did. At 14 months, 87% shared the goldfish crackers instead of the broccoli. By 18 months, only 31% made this mistake while 69% had learned to share what others liked, even if it differed from what they liked. This ability to imagine other people's perspectives, rather than getting stuck in our own perspectives, is a signature skill of successful givers in collaborations. Asterisk Interestingly, when George Meyer first started his career as a comedy writer, he didn't use his perspective-taking skills in the service of helping his colleagues. He saw his fellow writers as rivals. When you start out, you see other people as obstacles to your success. But that means your world will be full of obstacles, which is bad. In the early years, when some of my colleagues and friends, even close friends, would have a rip-roaring success of some kind, it was hard for me. I would feel jealousy, that their success somehow was a reproach to me. When you start your career, naturally you're mainly interested in advancing yourself and promoting yourself. But as Meyer worked on television shows, he began to run into the same people over and over. It was a small world, and a connected one. I realized it's a very small pond. There are only a few hundred people at any one time writing television comedy for a living, Meyer says. 
It's a good idea not to alienate these guys, and most of the jobs you get are more or less through word of mouth, or a recommendation. It's really important to have a good reputation. I quickly learned to see other comedy writers as allies. Meyer began to root for other people to succeed. It's not a zero-sum game. So if you hear that somebody got a pilot picked up, or one of their shows went to series, in a way that's really good, because comedy is doing better. This wasn't the path that Frank Lloyd Wright followed. He was undoubtedly a genius, but he wasn't a genius maker. When Wright succeeded, it didn't multiply the success of other architects, it usually came at their expense. As Wright's son John reflected, you do a good job building your buildings in keeping with your ideal. But you have been weak in your support of others in their desire for this same attainment. When it came to apprentices, his son charged, Wright never, stood behind one and helped him up. In one case, Wright promised his apprentices a drafting room so they could work, but it wasn't until seven years after starting the Taliesin Fellowship that he made good on his promise. At one point, a client admitted that he preferred to hire Wright's apprentices over Wright himself, as the apprentices matched his talent but exceeded his conscientiousness when it came to completing work on schedule and within budget. Wright was enraged, and he forbade his architects from accepting independent commissions, requiring them to put his name at the top of all their work. A number of his most talented and experienced apprentices quit, protesting that Wright exploited them for personal gain and stole credit for their work. It is amazing, this street. Aubin observes, that few of the hundreds, of Wright's, apprentices went on to achieve significant, independent careers as practicing architects. George Meyer's success had the opposite effect on his collaborators, it rippled, cascaded, and spread to the people around him. Meyer's colleagues call him a genius, but it's striking that he has also been a genius maker. By helping his fellow writers on The Simpsons, George Meyer made them more effective at their jobs, multiplying their collective effectiveness. He made me a better writer, inspiring me to think outside the box, Don Payne comments. Meyer's willingness to volunteer for unpopular tasks, help other people improve their jokes, and work long hours to achieve high collective standards rubbed off on his colleagues. He makes everyone try harder, John Biddy told a Harvard Crimson reporter, who exclaimed that, Meyer's presence spurs other Simpsons writers to be funnier, extolling Meyer's gift for, inspiring greatness in those around him. Meyer left The Simpsons in 2004 and is currently working on his first novel, tentatively titled Kick Me One Million Times or I'll Die, but his influence in the writer's room persists. Today, George's voice is strongly in the DNA of the show, says Payne, and he showed me that you don't have to be a jerk to get ahead. Carolyn Omini adds that, we all picked up a lot of George's comedic sense. Even though he's not here at The Simpsons anymore, we sometimes think in his way. Years later, Meyer is still working to lift his colleagues up. Despite winning five Emmy Awards, Tim Long hadn't achieved his lifelong dream, he wanted to be published in The New Yorker. In 2010, Long sent Meyer a draft of a submission. Meyer responded swiftly with incisive feedback. He just went through it line by line, and he was incredibly generous. His notes helped me fix things that were bugging me at the bottom of my soul, but I couldn't articulate them. Then, Meyer took his giving one step further. He reached out to an editor at The New Yorker to help Long get his foot in the door. By 2011, Long's dream was fulfilled, twice. By the time Meyer released the second issue of Army Man, he had 30 contributors. They all wrote jokes for free, and their careers soared along with Meyer's. At least seven of those contributors went on to write for The Simpsons. One contributor, Spike Ferriston, wrote a single Simpsons episode in 1995, and became an Emmy-nominated writer and producer on Seinfeld, where he wrote the famous, Soup Nazi, episode. And the Army Man contributors who didn't become Simpsons writers achieved success elsewhere. For example, Bob Odenkirk is a well-known writer and actor, Roz Chast is a staff cartoonist for The New Yorker, and Andy Barowitz became a best-selling author and creator of The Barowitz Report, a satire column and website with millions of fans.
Before that, Barowitz co-produced the hit movie Pleasantville and created The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which in turn launched Will Smith's career. By inviting them to write for Army Man, Meyer helped them soar. I just asked the people who made me laugh to contribute, Meyer told Mike Sachs. I didn't realize they would become illustrious. 4. Finding the Diamond in the Rough The Fact and Fiction of Recognizing Potential When we treat man as he is, we make him worse than he is, when we treat him as if he already were what he potentially could be, we make him what he should be. Attributed to Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, German writer, physicist, biologist, and artist. When Barack Obama entered the White House, a reporter asked him if he had a favorite app. Without hesitating, Obama named the iReggie, which, has my books, my newspapers, my music all in one place. The iReggie wasn't a piece of software, though. It was a man named Reggie Love, and no one would have guessed that he would become an indispensable resource to President Obama. Love was a star athlete at Duke, where he accomplished the rare feat of playing key roles on both the football and basketball teams. But after two years of failed NFL tryouts following graduation, he decided to shift gears. Having studied political science and public policy at Duke, Love pursued an internship on Capitol Hill. With a background as a jock and little work experience, he ended up with a position in the mailroom of Obama's Senate office. Yet within a year, at the young age of 26, Love was promoted up from the mailroom to become Obama's body man, or personal assistant. Love worked 18-hour days and flew more than 880,000 miles with Obama. His ability to juggle so many responsibilities with so little sleep has been an inspiration to watch, Obama said. He is the master of what he does. When Obama was elected president, an aide remarked that Love took care of the president. Love went out of his way to respond to every letter that came into his office. I always wanted to acknowledge people and let them know their voice was heard, Love told me. According to a reporter, Love is known for his exceptional and universal kindness. Decades earlier, in Love's home state of North Carolina, a woman named Beth Trainum decided to go back to school to study accounting. Beth was in her early 30s, and numbers were not her strong suit. She didn't learn to tell time on an analog clock until she was in third grade, and in high school, she leaned heavily on a boyfriend to get her through her math classes. Even in adulthood, she struggled with percentages. When it came time to take the Certified Public Accountant CPA exam, Beth was convinced that she would fail. Beyond the fact that she had trouble with math, she was facing serious time constraints. She was juggling a full-time job with taking care of three children at home, two of whom were toddlers, both of whom came down with chicken pox within two weeks of the exam. The lowest point came when she spent an entire weekend trying to understand pension accounting, and after three days, felt like she understood less than when she started. When Beth sat down to take the CPA exam, right off the bat, she had a panic attack when she looked at the multiple choice questions. I would rather go through natural childbirth again than ever have to sit for that exam again, Beth said. She left dejected, certain that she had failed. On a Monday morning in August 1992, Beth's phone rang. The voice on the other end of the line said that she had earned the gold medal on the CPA exam in North Carolina. She thought it was a friend playing a joke on her, so she called the state board later that day to verify the news. It wasn't a joke, Beth had the single highest score in the entire state. Later, she was dumbfounded when she received another award. The National Elijah Watts Sells Award for Distinctive Performance, granted to the top 10 CPA exam scores in the whole country, beating out 136,525 other candidates. Today, Beth is a widely respected partner at the accounting firm Hughes, Pittman & Gupton, LLC. She has been named an Impact 25 financial leader and one of the top 25 women in business in the research triangle. Beth Trainum and Reggie Love have led dramatically different lives. Aside from their professional success and their North Carolina roots, there is one common thread that unites them. 
His name is C. J. Skender, and he is a living legend. Skender teaches accounting, but to call him an accounting professor doesn't do him justice. He's a unique character, known for his trademark bow ties and his ability to recite the words to thousands of songs and movies on command. He may well be the only 58-year-old man with fair skin and white hair who displays a poster of the rapper 50 Cent in his office. And while he's a genuine numbers whiz, his impact in the classroom is impossible to quantify. Skender is one of a few professors for whom Duke University and the University of North Carolina look past their rivalry to cooperate. He is in such high demand that he has permission to teach simultaneously at both schools. He has earned more than two dozen major teaching awards, including 14 at UNC, 6 at Duke, and 5 at North Carolina State. Across his career, he has now taught close to 600 classes and evaluated more than 35,000 students. Because of the time that he invests in his students, he has developed what may be his single most impressive skill, a remarkable eye for talent. In 2004, Reggie Love enrolled in C. J. Skender's accounting class at Duke. It was a summer course that Love needed to graduate, and while many professors would have written him off as a jock, Skender recognized Love's potential beyond athletics. For some reason, Duke football players have never flocked to my class, Skender explains, but I knew Reggie had what it took to succeed. Skender went out of his way to engage Love in class, and his intuition was right that it would pay dividends. I knew nothing about accounting before I took C. Jay's class, Love says, and the fundamental base of knowledge from that course helped guide me down the road to the White House. In Obama's mailroom, Love used the knowledge of inventory that he learned in Skender's class to develop a more efficient process for organizing and digitizing a huge backlog of mail. It was the number one thing I implemented, Love says, and it impressed Obama's chief of staff, putting Love on the radar. In 2011, Love left the White House to study at Wharton. He sent a note to Skender, I'm on the train to Philly to start the executive MBA program and one of the first classes is financial accounting, and I just wanted to say thanks for sticking with me when I was in your class. A dozen years earlier, after Beth Trainum took the CPA exam, she approached Skender to warn him about her disappointing performance. She told him she was sure she flunked the entire exam, but Skender knew better. He promised, if you didn't pass, I'll pay your mortgage. Skender was right again, and he wasn't just right about Beth. That spring, the silver and bronze medalists on the CPA exam in North Carolina were also his students. Skender's students earned the top three scores of all 3,396 CPA candidates who took the exam. It was the first time in North Carolina that any school had swept the medals, and although accounting was a male-dominated field, all three of Skender's medalists were women. In total, Skender has had more than 40 different students win CPA medals by placing in the top three in the state. He has also demonstrated a knack for identifying future teachers. More than three dozen students have followed in his footsteps into university teaching. How does he know talent when he sees it? It may sound like pure intuition, but C. J. Skender's skill in recognizing potential has rigorous science behind it. Spotting and cultivating talent are essential skills in just about every industry, it's difficult to overstate the value of surrounding ourselves with stars. As with networking and collaboration, when it comes to discovering the potential in others, reciprocity styles shape our approaches and effectiveness. In this chapter, I want to show you how givers succeed by recognizing potential in others. Along with tracing Skender's techniques, we'll take a look at how talent scouts identify world-class athletes, why people end up overinvesting in low-potential candidates, and what top musicians say about their first teachers. But the best place to start is the military, where psychologists have spent three decades investigating what it takes to identify the most talented cadets. Star Search. In the early 1980s, a psychologist named Dov Eden published the first in a series of extraordinary results. He could tell which soldiers in the Israel Defense Forces IDF would become top performers before they ever started training. 
Eden is a physically slight but psychologically intense man who grew up in the United States. After finishing his doctorate, he immigrated to Israel and began conducting research with the IDF. In one study, he examined comprehensive assessments of nearly a thousand soldiers who were about to arrive for training with their platoons. He had their aptitude test scores, evaluations during basic training, and appraisals from previous commanders. Using this information alone, which was gathered before the beginning of training for their current roles, Eden was able to identify a group of high-potential trainees who would emerge as stars. Over the next 11 weeks, the trainees took tests measuring their expertise in combat tactics, maps, and standard operating procedures. They also demonstrated their skill in operating a weapon, which was evaluated by experts. Sure enough, the candidates Eden spotted as high potentials at the outset did significantly better than their peers over the next three months. They scored 9% higher on the expertise tests and 10% higher on the weapons evaluation. What information did Eden use to identify the high potentials? If you were a platoon leader in the IDF, what characteristics would you value above all others in your soldiers? It's helpful to know that Eden drew his inspiration from a classic study led by the Harvard psychologist Robert Rosenthal, who teamed up with Lenore Jacobson, the principal of an elementary school in San Francisco. In 18 different classrooms, students from kindergarten through fifth grade took a Harvard Cognitive Ability Test. The test objectively measured students' verbal and reasoning skills, which are known to be critical to learning and problem-solving. Rosenthal and Jacobson shared the test results with the teachers. Approximately 20% of the students had shown the potential for intellectual blooming, or spurting. Although they might not look different today, their test results suggested that these bloomers would show unusual intellectual gains over the course of the school year. The Harvard test was discerning. When the students took the cognitive ability test a year later, the bloomers improved more than the rest of the students. The bloomers gained an average of 12 IQ points, compared with average gains of only 8 points for their classmates. The bloomers outgained their peers by roughly 15 IQ points in first grade and 10 IQ points in second grade. Two years later, the bloomers were still outgaining their classmates. The intelligence test was successful in identifying high potential students. The bloomers got smarter, and at a faster rate, than their classmates. Based on these results, intelligence seems like a strong contender as the key differentiating factor for the high potential students. But it wasn't, at least not in the beginning. Why not? The students labeled as bloomers didn't actually score higher on the Harvard intelligence test. Rosenthal chose them at random. The study was designed to find out what happened to students when teachers believed they had high potential. Rosenthal randomly selected 20% of the students in each classroom to be labeled as bloomers, and the other 80% were a control group. The bloomers weren't any smarter than their peers, the difference, was in the mind of the teacher. Yet the bloomers became smarter than their peers, in both verbal and reasoning ability. Some students who were randomly labeled as bloomers achieved more than 50% intelligence gains in a single year. The ability advantage to the bloomers held up when the students had their intelligence tested at the end of the year by separate examiners who weren't aware that the experiment had occurred, let alone which students were identified as bloomers. And the students labeled as bloomers continued to show gains after two years, even when they were being taught by entirely different teachers who didn't know which students had been labeled as bloomers. Why? Teachers' beliefs created self-fulfilling prophecies. When teachers believed their students were bloomers, they set high expectations for their success. As a result, the teachers engaged in more supportive behaviors that boosted the students' confidence and enhanced their learning and development. Teachers communicated more warmly to the bloomers, gave them more challenging assignments, called on them more often, and provided them with more feedback. Many experiments have replicated these effects, showing that teacher expectations are especially important for improving the grades and intelligence test scores of low-achieving students and members of stigmatized minority groups.
In a comprehensive review of the evidence, psychologists Lee Jussum and Kent Harbour concluded, self-fulfilling prophecies in the classroom are real. But we all know that children are impressionable in the early phases of intellectual development. When Dov Eden began his research at the IDF, he wondered whether these types of self-fulfilling prophecies could play out with more fully formed adults. He told some platoon leaders that he had reviewed aptitude test scores, evaluations during basic training, and appraisals from previous commanders, and that the average command potential of your trainees is appreciably higher than the usual level. Therefore, you can expect unusual achievements from the trainees in your group. As in the elementary school study, Eden had selected these trainees as high potentials at random. He was testing the effect of leaders believing that their trainees were high potentials. Amazingly, the trainees randomly labeled as high potentials did significantly better on expertise tests and weapons evaluations than the trainees who were not arbitrarily designated as high potentials. Just like the teachers, when the platoon leaders believed in the trainee's potential, they acted in ways that made this potential a reality. The platoon leaders who held high expectations of their trainees provided more help, career advice, and feedback to their trainees. When their trainees made mistakes, instead of assuming that they lacked ability, the platoon leaders saw opportunities for teaching and learning. The supportive behaviors of the platoon leaders boosted the confidence and ability of the trainees, enabling and encouraging them to achieve higher performance. Evidence shows that leaders' beliefs can catalyze self-fulfilling prophecies in many settings beyond the military. Management researcher Brian McNatt conducted an exhaustive analysis of 17 different studies with nearly 3,000 employees in a wide range of work organizations, from banking to retail sales to manufacturing. Overall, when managers were randomly assigned to see employees as bloomers, employees bloomed. McNatt concludes that these interventions can have a fairly large effect on performance. He encourages managers to recognize the possible power and influence in of having a genuine interest and belief in the potential of their employees and be engaging in actions that support others and communicate that belief. Increasing others' motivation and effort and helping them achieve that potential. Some managers and teachers have already internalized this message. They see people as bloomers naturally, without ever being told. This is rarely the case for takers, who tend to place little trust in other people. Because they assume that most people are takers, they hold relatively low expectations for the potential of their peers and subordinates. Research shows that takers harbor doubts about others' intentions, so they monitor vigilantly for information that others might harm them, treating others with suspicion and distrust. These low expectations trigger a vicious cycle, constraining the development and motivation of others. Even when takers are impressed by another person's capabilities or motivation, they're more likely to see this person as a threat, which means they're less willing to support and develop him or her. As a result, takers frequently fail to engage in the types of supportive behaviors that are conducive to the confidence and development of their peers and subordinates. Matchers are better equipped to inspire self-fulfilling prophecies. Because they value reciprocity, when a peer or subordinate demonstrates high potential, matchers respond in kind, going out of their way to support, encourage, and develop their promising colleagues and direct reports. But the matcher's mistake lies in waiting for signs of high potential. Since matchers tend to play it safe, they often wait to offer support until they've seen evidence of promise. Consequently, they miss out on opportunities to develop people who don't show a spark of talent or high potential at first. Givers don't wait for signs of potential. Because they tend to be trusting and optimistic about other people's intentions, in their roles as leaders, managers, and mentors, givers are inclined to see the potential in everyone. By default, givers start by viewing people as bloomers. This is exactly what has enabled C. J. Skender to develop so many star students. He isn't unusual in recognizing talented people, he simply starts by seeing everyone as talented and tries to bring out the best in them. In Skender's mind, every student who walks into his classroom is a diamond in the rough, able and willing to be mined, cut, and polished. 
He sees potential where others don't, which has set in motion a series of self-fulfilling prophecies. Polishing the Diamond in the Rough in 1985, a student of Skender's named Marie Arcuri sat for the CPA exam. She wasn't a good standardized test taker, and she didn't pass the first time. A few days later, she received a letter in the mail from Skender. He wrote to every single student who had taken the exam, congratulating those who passed and encouraging those who didn't. For the past quarter century, Marie has saved the letter. Your husband, family, and friends love you because of the beautiful person you have made yourself, not because of a performance on an examination. Remember that. Focus on November. Concentrate on practice. I want what's best for you. You will get through this thing, Marie. I write on my tests, the primary purpose has already been served by your preparation for this exam. Success doesn't measure a human being, effort does. Studies show that accountants are more likely to achieve their potential when they receive the type of encouragement that Skender provided. Several years ago, 72 new auditors joined a big four accounting firm. Half of the auditors were randomly assigned to receive information that they had high potential to succeed. The study was led by researcher Brian McNatt, who had a doctorate, two accounting degrees, a CPA certification, and five years of experience as an accountant and auditor. McNatt read the resumes of the auditors who were randomly assigned to believe in their potential. Then, he met with each of the auditors and informed them that they were hired after a highly competitive selection process, management had high expectations for their success, and they had the skills to overcome challenges and be successful. Three weeks later, McNatt sent them a letter reinforcing this message. For a full month, the auditors who received McNatt's message earned higher performance ratings than the auditors in the control group, who never met with McNatt or received a letter from him. This was true even after controlling for the auditor's intelligence test scores and college grades. This is the effect that Skender's letter had on Marie Arcuri. He encouraged her to believe in her potential and set high expectations for her to succeed. He saw the best in his students, and still sees the best in his students, Marie says. She took the exam again and passed two sections, leaving two more to go. Along the way, Skender continued encouraging her. He wasn't going to let me slack off one bit. He would call me and check in on my progress. She passed the final section and earned her CPA in 1987, two years after she started taking the four sections of the exam. The difference he made in my life was in making sure my priorities were in order, keeping me on track, and preventing me from throwing in the towel, Marie explains. I knew how much he'd invested in me, and I was not going to let him down. Today, Marie owns two Lexus automobile dealerships. The accounting background and the skills in reading financial statements have been valuable. But more than C. J. taught me material for my job, he built my character, my passion, and my determination. His commitment to making sure that I got through led me to realize that I'd rather be defined by perseverance than by whether or not I passed an exam. Skender's approach contrasts with the basic model most companies follow when it comes to leadership development, identify high potential people, and then provide them with the mentoring, support, and resources needed to grow to achieve their potential. To identify these high potential future leaders, each year companies spend billions of dollars assessing and evaluating talent. Despite the popularity of this model, givers recognize that it is fatally flawed in one respect. The identification of talent may be the wrong place to start. For many years, psychologists believed that in any domain, success depended on talent first and motivation second. To groom world-class athletes and musicians, experts looked for people with the right raw abilities and then sought to motivate them. If you want to find people who can dunk like Michael Jordan or play piano like Beethoven, it's only natural to start by screening candidates for leaping ability and an ear for music. But in recent years, psychologists have come to believe that this approach may be backward. In the 1960s, a pioneering psychologist named Raymond Cattell developed an investment theory of intelligence. 
He proposed that interest is what drives people to invest their time and energy in developing particular skills and bases of knowledge. Today, we have compelling evidence that interest precedes the development of talent. It turns out that motivation is the reason that people develop talent in the first place. In the 1980s, the psychologist Benjamin Bloom led a landmark study of world-class musicians, scientists, and athletes. Bloom's team interviewed 21 concert pianists who were finalists in major international competitions. When the researchers began to dig into the eminent pianists' early experiences with music, they discovered an unexpected absence of raw talent. The study showed that early on most of the star pianists seemed special only when comparing one child with others in the family or neighborhood. They didn't stand out on a local, regional, or national level, and they didn't win many early competitions. When Bloom's team interviewed the world-class pianists and their parents, they stumbled upon another surprise. The pianists didn't start out learning from piano teachers who were experts. They typically took their first piano lessons with a teacher who lived nearby in their neighborhoods. In The Talent Code, Daniel Coyle writes that, from a scientific perspective, it was as if the researchers had traced the lineage of the world's most beautiful swans back to a scruffy flock of barnyard chickens. Over time, even without an expert teacher at the outset, the pianists managed to become the best musicians in the world. The pianists gained their advantage by practicing many more hours than their peers. As Malcolm Gladwell showed us in Outliers, research led by psychologist Anders Ericsson reveals that attaining expertise in a domain typically requires 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. But what motivates people to practice at such length in the first place? This is where givers often enter the picture. When the pianists and their parents talked about their first piano teachers, they consistently focused on one theme, the teachers were caring, kind, and patient. The pianists looked forward to piano lessons because their first teachers made music interesting and fun. The children had very positive experiences with their first lessons. They made contact with another adult, outside their home, who was warm, supportive, and loving, Bloom's team explains. The world-class pianists had their initial interest sparked by teachers who were givers. The teachers looked for ways to make piano lessons enjoyable, which served as an early catalyst for the intense practice necessary to develop expertise. Exploring possibilities and engaging in a wide variety of musical activities took precedence, over factors such as, right or wrong or good or bad. The same patterns emerged for world-class tennis players. When Bloom's team interviewed 18 American tennis players who had been ranked in the top 10 in the world, they found that although their first coaches were not exceptional coaches, they tended to be very good with young children. What this first coach provided was motivation for the child to become interested in tennis and to spend time practicing. In roles as leaders and mentors, givers resist the temptation to search for talent first. By recognizing that anyone can be a bloomer, givers focus their attention on motivation. The top-ranked tennis players tended to have a first coach who took a special interest in the tennis player, Bloom's team notes, usually because he perceived the player as being motivated and willing to work hard, rather than because of any special physical abilities. In the accounting classroom, looking for motivation and work ethic, not only intellectual ability, is part of what has made C. J. Skender so successful in recognizing talent. When Skender bet Beth Trainum that she would pass the CPA exam, it wasn't because she was unusually gifted in accounting. It was because he noticed how hard she worked all semester. When Skender recognized that Reggie Love had promise, whereas others wrote him off as just another jock, it was because Love worked diligently and was always prepared for class, Skender says. He was interested in learning and bettering himself. When Skender encouraged Marie R. Curie, it was because she was the most involved and committed individual I have ever met. Her persistence set her apart. The psychologist Angela Duckworth calls this grit having passion and perseverance toward long-term goals. Her research shows that above and beyond intelligence and aptitude, gritty people, by virtue of their interest, focus, and drive, achieve higher performance. 
Persistence is incredibly important, says psychologist Tom Kolditz, a brigadier general who headed up behavioral sciences and leadership at the U.S. Military Academy for a dozen years. The standard selection rate for army officers to key command positions is 12 percent. Kolditz's former faculty have been selected at rates as high as 75 percent, and he chalks much of it up to selecting candidates based on grit. As George Anders writes in The Rare Find, you can't take motivation for granted. Of course, natural talent also matters, but once you have a pool of candidates above the threshold of necessary potential, grit is a major factor that predicts how close they get to achieving their potential. This is why givers focus on gritty people, it's where givers have the greatest return on their investment, the most meaningful and lasting impact. And along with investing their time in motivating gritty people, givers like Skender strive to cultivate grit in the first place. Setting high expectations is so important, Skender says. You have to push people, make them stretch and do more than they think possible. When they take my tests, I want them thinking it was the toughest exam they've ever seen in their lives. It makes them better learners. To encourage effort, he gives them a half dozen past exams for practice. They need to make a significant investment, and it pays off. Forcing them to work harder than they ever have in their lives benefits them in the long run. One of the keys to cultivating grit is making the task at hand more interesting and motivating. In Bloom's study, across the board, the talented musicians and athletes were initially taught by givers, teachers who liked children and rewarded them with praise, signs of approval, or even candy when they did anything right. They were extremely encouraging. They were enthusiastic about the talent field and what they had to teach these children. In many cases, they treated the child as a friend of the family might. Perhaps the major quality of these teachers was that they made the initial learning very pleasant and rewarding. This description could have been written about Skender. At first glance, he seems to fit the stereotype of an accounting whiz. Asterisk but at various stages in his life, Skender aspired to be a disc jockey, musician, actor, talk show host, and stand-up comedian. Set foot in his classroom, and you'll see that he hasn't quite given up on these dreams. True to his compulsive nature and eclectic taste, he punctuates his courses with entertaining routines to keep his students engaged, playing four songs at the start of each class and tossing candy bars to the first students who shout out the correct answers to music trivia. This is how a poster of a rapper ended up on his wall. If you want to engage your audience, if you really want to grab their attention, you have to know the world they live in, the music they listen to, the movies they watch, he explains. To most of these kids, accounting is like a root canal. But when they hear me quote Usher or CeeLo Green, they say to themselves, whoa, did that fat old white-haired guy just say what I thought he said? And then you've got him. By cultivating interest in accounting, Skender believes that his students will be more likely to invest the time and energy necessary to master the discipline. C. J. is the epitome of someone who is empathetic, Reggie Love says. He knows more about music than anyone, and he's always able to weave it into the lecture to help people connect with the material. When you think about having to take a hard course, which typically isn't very interesting, having to keep up with it is challenging. C. J. made it interesting, and I ended up working harder as a result. Love earned an A in Skender's class. David Moltz, a former student of Skender's who works at Google, elaborates that Skender helps every single student and person he comes across in any way possible. He sacrifices hundreds of hours of his personal life to make an impact on the lives of students and teach as many of them as possible. He goes out of his way to make everyone that he engages with feel special. Throwing good money after bad talent. Because they see potential all around them, givers end up investing a lot of their time in encouraging and developing people to achieve this potential. These investments don't always pay off, some candidates lack the raw talent, and others don't sustain their passion or maintain the requisite level of grit. Skender once wrote more than 100 recommendation letters for a student who was applying to graduate programs outside of accounting.
She was rejected by all of the programs in her first year, and she decided to apply again, so he dutifully rewrote the recommendation letters. When the schools turned her down once more, Skender revised his recommendation letters for a third year in a row. Finally, after three strikes, Skender encouraged her to pursue a different route. If Skender were more of a taker or a matcher, would he have given up sooner, saving his own time and the students? Do givers overinvest in people who possess loads of passion but fall short on aptitude, and how do they manage their priorities to focus on people who show promise while investing less in those who don't? To find out, there's nowhere better to look than professional basketball, where the annual NBA draft tests talent experts on an international stage. The late Stu Inman is remembered as the man behind two of the worst draft mistakes in the history of the National Basketball Association. In 1972, the Portland Trail Blazers had the first pick in the draft. Inman was serving as the director of player personnel, and he picked center LaRue Martin, who turned out to be a disappointment, averaging just over five points and four rebounds per game in four seasons with the Blazers. In drafting Martin, Inman passed up two of the greatest players in NBA history. The second pick that year was Bob McAdoo, who scored more points in his first season than Martin did in his entire career. McAdoo was named Rookie of the Year, and two years later, he was the NBA's most valuable player. In his 14-year NBA career, McAdoo won the league scoring title twice, played on two championship teams, and made five all-star teams. In that draft, Inman also missed out on Julius Irving, better known as Dr. Zsh who was selected 12th. Irving ended up leading his teams to three championships, winning four MVP awards, making 16 all-star teams, and becoming one of the top five leading scorers in the history of professional basketball. Both McAdoo and Irving are members of the Basketball Hall of Fame. A dozen years later, after being promoted to general manager of the Blazers, Stu Inman had the chance to redeem himself. In the 1984 NBA draft, Inman had the second pick. He chose another center, Sam Bowie, who was over seven feet tall, but athletic and coordinated, he could shoot, pass, and steal, not to mention block shots and grab rebounds. But Bowie never lived up to his potential. When he retired from basketball, ESPN named him the worst draft pick in the history of North American professional sports. In 2003, Sports Illustrated, whose cover Bowie had graced years earlier, called him the second biggest draft flop in the history of the NBA. The biggest. LaRue Martin. In selecting Bowie second, Inman passed up on a shooting guard from North Carolina named Michael Jordan. With the third pick, the Chicago Bulls selected Jordan, and the rest is history. After being named Rookie of the Year, Jordan racked up six championships, 10 scoring titles, and 11 MVP awards while making 14 All-Star teams and averaging more points than any player ever. He was recognized as the greatest North American athlete of the 20th century by ESPN. Inman recognized Jordan's potential, but the Blazers already had two strong guards. They needed a center, so he drafted Sam Bowie. With that choice, he didn't just miss out on Michael Jordan, he also passed up future Hall of Famers Charles Barkley, drafted 5th, and John Stockton, drafted 16th. It was bad enough that Inman chose Martin over McAdoo and Irving, and Bowie over Jordan, Barkley, and Stockton. But drafting professional basketball players is at best an imperfect science, and even great managers and coaches make mistakes. What was worse was that the Blazers held on to both players far longer than they should have. They kept LaRue Martin for four seasons, and by the time they decided to trade him, he had virtually no value. The Blazers couldn't even get an actual player in exchange for Martin, they gave him away in exchange for, future considerations, from the Seattle Supersonics, who ended up letting him go before the season even started. That was the end of Martin's basketball career, and it was an embarrassing outcome for Inman. It was a sore subject, said Jack Ramsey, who was the Blazers coach in Martin's last year and now serves as an ESPN analyst. Because LaRue couldn't play, he was trying to make the team when I got there, but we had no place for him.
He had no offensive game. And he wasn't a rebounder or shot blocker even though he was 6'11". So he had no skills. The Blazers followed a similar path with Sam Bowie. In 1989, after five lackluster seasons, the Blazers finally traded Bowie to the New Jersey Nets. Why did the Blazers hold on to Sam Bowie and LaRue Martin for so long? Stu Inman was widely known as a giver. After playing college basketball and coaching high school basketball for a few years, Inman made the leap to college coach, eventually becoming the head coach at his alma mater, San Jose State. In this role, Inman seemed to prioritize players' interests ahead of his own success. One of Inman's star recruits was Tommy Smith, an exceptional athlete who came to San Jose State to run track and play football and basketball. On the freshman basketball team, Smith was the top scorer and rebounder, so in his sophomore year, he began practicing with the varsity basketball team under Inman. One day, Smith came by Inman's office and announced that he was going to quit basketball to focus on track. I thought he was going to blow up at me, Smith writes, but he didn't. Coach Inman said, okay, Tom, I understand, he shook my hand and told me to be sure to come by to see him whenever I wanted to, and that I was always welcome back if I changed my mind. That was the greatest thing in the world for me. It wasn't so great for Inman. Smith's speed could have added a great deal to the San Jose State basketball team. A few years later, in 1968, Smith won the Olympic gold medal in the 200-meter dash, setting a world record. But Inman had wanted what was best for Smith. Along with letting top talent walk away, Inman made room for gritty players even if they lacked talent. When a skinny white player named Terry Murphy tried out for the varsity team, Inman respected his work ethic and invited him on board. Murphy recalls being one of the worst players Inman had ever coached. I scored four points the whole year. Despite this lackluster performance, Inman told Murphy, I'm never gonna cut you, you're enthusiastic and you play hard and you're a good guy. Inman was, continually giving advice to any basketball junkie who sought it, writes Wayne Thompson, a reporter who covered the Blazers throughout Inman's tenure. He couldn't help it. Teaching at any level on any subject is the most rewarding thing you can do, Inman told Thompson. I just love to see the expression on the face of a student who gets it for the first time. Just watching the learning process come to full bloom gives me such a rush. Once Inman developed a positive impression of players, was he too committed to teaching and developing them, so much that he invested in motivated players even if they lacked the requisite talent? In the classroom, C. J. Skender can afford to dedicate his time to students who demonstrate interest and drive, as he can teach and mentor a large number of students each semester. Conversely, in professional basketball and most work organizations, we face more limits. Making a bet on one person's potential means passing on others. Inman had made a commitment to developing LaRue Martin and Sam Bowie. If Inman had been more of a taker, doesn't it seem obvious that he would have cut his losses much more quickly and moved on to other players? The moment he realized that Martin and Bowie weren't contributing to his team's success, a taker wouldn't feel any sense of responsibility to them. And if Inman had been more of a matcher, wouldn't he have been more willing to let them go? Surely a matcher would grow frustrated that his investments in Martin and Bowie were not being reciprocated or rewarded. It might seem that givers have a harder time letting go. But in reality, the exact opposite is true. It turns out that givers are the least vulnerable to the mistake of overinvesting in people, and that being a giver is what prevented Stu Inman from making far worse mistakes. Facing the mirror, looking good or doing good. Barry Staw is a world-renowned organizational behavior professor at the University of California at Berkeley, and he has spent his career trying to understand why people make bad decisions in organizations. In an ingenious study, Sta and Ha Hoang collected data on all 240-plus players who were picked in the first two rounds of the NBA draft between 1980 and 1986, in hopes of seeing what effect draft position had on a player's career. They measured each player's performance with a series of different metrics, scoring points per minute, 
field goal percentage, and free throw percentage toughness rebounds and blocks per minute, and quickness assists and steals per minute. Sta and Hoang controlled for each player's performance on all of these metrics, as well as for the player's injuries and illnesses, whether the player was a guard, forward, or center, and the quality of the player's team based on win-loss records. Then they examined how much time on the court the players received and how long their teams kept them before trading them, to see if teams made the mistake of overinvesting in players just because they drafted them early. The results produced a devastating conclusion, teams couldn't let go of their big bets. They stuck with the players whom they drafted early, giving them more playing time and refusing to trade them even if they played poorly. After taking performance out of the equation, players who were drafted earlier still spent more minutes on the court and were less likely to be traded. For every slot higher in the draft, players were given an average of 22 more minutes in their second season, and their teams were still investing more in them by their fifth season, when each draft slot higher accounted for 11 more minutes on the court. And for every slot higher in the draft, players were 3% less likely to be traded. This study is a classic case of what Sta calls escalation of commitment to a losing course of action. Over the past four decades, extensive research led by Sta shows that once people make an initial investment of time, energy, or resources, when it goes sour, they're at risk for increasing their investment. Gamblers in the hole believe that if they just play one more hand of poker, they'll be able to recover their losses or even win big. Struggling entrepreneurs think that if they just give their startups a little more sweat, they can turn it around. When an investment doesn't pay off, even if the expected value is negative, we invest more. Economists explain this behavior using a concept known as the sunk cost fallacy. When estimating the value of a future investment, we have trouble ignoring what we've already invested in the past. Sunk costs are part of the story, but new research shows that other factors matter more. To figure out why and when escalation of commitment happens, researchers at Michigan State University analyzed 166 different studies. Sunk costs do have a small effect. Decision makers are biased in favor of their previous investments, but three other factors are more powerful. One is anticipated regret. Will I be sorry that I didn't give this another chance? The second is project completion. If I keep investing, I can finish the project. But the single most powerful factor is ego threat. If I don't keep investing, I'll look and feel like a fool. In response to ego threat, people invest more, hoping to turn the project into a success so they can prove to others, and themselves, that they were right all along. In one study led by Sta, when California bank customers defaulted on loans, the managers who originally funded the loans struggled to let go and write off the losses. Bankers who have been closely associated with decisions to fund problem loans are the ones to show the greatest difficulty in acknowledging the subsequent risks of these loans and the likelihood of default, Sta and colleagues write. The study showed that when managers who originally funded the problem loans left the bank, the new managers were significantly more likely to write the loans off. The new managers had no personal responsibility for the problem loans, so their egos weren't under threat, they didn't feel compelled to justify the original decisions as wise. Research suggests that due to their susceptibility to ego threat, takers are more vulnerable to escalation of commitment than givers. Imagine that you're running an aircraft company, and you have to decide whether or not to invest $1 million in a plane that's invisible to radar technology. You find out that the project is not doing well financially, and a competitor has already finished a better model. But you've made significant investments, the project is 50% complete, and you've already spent $5 million and 18 months working on it. How likely are you to invest the extra $1 million? In this study by Henry Moon at London Business School, before making their investment decisions, 360 people completed a questionnaire that included giver statements such as, I keep my promises, and taker statements such as, I try to get others to do my duties. The takers were significantly more likely to invest the extra $1 million than the givers.
They felt responsible for an investment that was going bad, so they committed more to protect their pride and save face. As University of South Carolina management professors Bruce Meglino and Audrey Korsgaard explain, although the organization itself might be better off if the decision were abandoned, such action would cause the decision maker to incur significant personal costs, e.g., loss of career mobility, loss of reputation. Because escalating his or her commitment allows the decision maker to keep the prospect of failure hidden, such behavior is personally rational, from the perspective of a taker. The givers, on the other hand, were primarily concerned about protecting other people and the organization, so they were more willing to admit their initial mistakes and to escalate their commitment. Other studies show that people actually make more accurate and creative decisions when they're choosing on behalf of others than themselves. When people make decisions in a self-focused state, they're more likely to be biased by ego threat and often agonize over trying to find a choice that's ideal in all possible dimensions. When people focus on others, as givers do naturally, they're less likely to worry about egos and minuscule details, they look at the big picture and prioritize what matters most to others. Armed with this understanding, it's worth revisiting the story of Stu Inman. As a giver, although he felt invested in the players he drafted first, he felt a stronger sense of responsibility to the team. Stu was a kind person, considerate of other people's feelings, Wayne Thompson told me. But he never let that influence selections. If he didn't think a guy could play, he put his arm around him and wished him well. Inman wasn't the one responsible for keeping Sam Bowie on board, Inman left the Blazers in 1986, just two years after drafting Bowie. A taker might have continued to defend the bad decision, but Inman admitted his error in choosing Bowie over Jordan. All our scouts thought Bowie was the answer to our problems, and I did, too, Inman said, but, it was a mistake. Asterisk. Inman didn't escalate his commitment to LaRue Martin either. Although the Blazers kept Martin for four seasons, Inman and his colleagues took early action in response to Martin's poor performance. In his rookie season, when there were clear signs that Martin was floundering, a taker might have given him extra playing time in an effort to justify choosing him ahead of Bob McAdoo and Julius Irving. But this wasn't what happened. The Blazers granted the starting center position to the hardworking Lloyd Neal, who was just 6, 7, putting Martin at backup. In his rookie season, Martin averaged less than 13 minutes per game on the court, compared with 32 for McAdoo and 42 for Irving. In his second season, Martin continued to underperform, and instead of escalating commitment by giving him more time on the court, the Blazers gave him less, under 11 minutes per game, whereas McAdoo played 43 and Irving played over 40. Inman and his colleagues managed to overcome the temptation to keep betting on Martin. A major reason why givers are less vulnerable than takers to escalation of commitment has to do with responses to feedback, as demonstrated in research by Audrey Korsgaard, Bruce Meglino, and Scott Lester on how givers and takers react to information about their performance. In one study, people filled out a survey indicating whether they were givers or takers and made 10 decisions about how to solve problems. Then, all participants received a performance score and a suggestion to delegate their authority more when making decisions. The score was randomly assigned so that half of the participants learned that their performance was above average, whereas the other half were told that they were below average. Then, all participants made 10 more decisions. Would they use the suggestion to delegate more?